Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 258, recorded August 2nd, 2011. The Trillion Dollar Coin. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, visit audible.com slash MacBreak. And by FreshBooks, the easy online invoicing service that gets you paid quickly and makes you look more professional. Get started with a free package at FreshBooks.com. And by GoToMeeting, now with high-definition group video conferencing. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com, offer code MACBREAK. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show that covers everything you'd like to know about those folks, those, those, those weird people down in Cupertino, California. We know them as Apple Computer. And here to my in-studio, to my right, Mr. Alex Lindsay. But look, we've also got some people uh, via videocast, including from Boston. Andy Anako, star of The Late Show with David Letterman. Or is it The Cow that's the star of The Late Show with David Letterman? Well, I'm, I'm proud to say that I've been a guest of the sidewalk in front of the Ed Sullivan <laughs> Theater. Uh, and you, know, you, don't, you don't get much for that appearance, but you know the exposure you get by being on the sidewalk, especially on a hot day when Dave has the hose out and he's squirting people uh, on, on camera. Really, it's, it's, it's all part of a multi-level marketing campaign. And actually getting into the Late Show as, a, uh, as an audience member is very akin to jury selection, which we were just talking about. Cause, um, <laughs> I, I was just doing my jury duty this morning. That's why we're starting a little bit late. It's very similar because they interview you. You go through this line, and there's a person. There's people with clipboards, and they spotted me. They said, "Oh, hi, Leo. We'll be putting you in the special VIP section." <laughs> what does that mean? Well, they want all the um, they want all the people from Oklahoma sitting in the front. You know, we're gonna go, "Yeah, David, I love you." Holding up signs and stuff, and then media people are too. We're too jaded, so they put us up in the <laughs> way in the balcony, way behind the cameras where you can't, you know. So that's the special section. No, that's that, the VIP. No, that, that's actually section. the best section. That's the only section of the audience where you can where you can absolutely see anything that's going on other than a cameraman's butt. That's so. probably true. You do have a great view, and it's fun to watch a uh, show like that get done. They start on time, you know. <laughs> Not, well, they, I haven't learned that lesson apparently. They, they, they broadcast on time. Of course, they. they, 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 they I think they start. usually start on time. Yeah. Too. Also joining us, Adam <laughs> Angst, uh, the editor in chief for the last twenty years of the best. Mac newsletter of all Mac tidbits. It's good to see you, Adam. Thank you, Leo. Join and us. I have to say, I've actually never been called for jury duty. Don't say that out years. loud. Are I, you a registered I, voter? I, yeah. <laughs> I, I am a registered voter, and uh, um, you know, it's like I've been. There have been a couple of times when they've they've said, "Oh, you'll need to come for jury duty," and then they've canceled it. Yeah. The, the trial yeah. was off. So, well, I've been. I've so, been. Yeah, so. I've been in the pool three times, <laughs> but I've never been invited to go for a swim. I've only been in the pool once. I actually want to. They show now. They show this movie. Um, oh, what's it called? It's like <laughs> Twelve Jurors. Yes, uh, America. <laughs> America. Your civic responsibility. A really good thing. And then they show you this whole thing. It's really good. The the video is like a fifteen minute video on why it's a good thing to be a juror. And I was in tears at the end of it. And you know, but I cry at anything. And uh, and it makes you want to be a juror because you know it's how our how our justice system works and all that. So I actually wanted to be on this jury. I have a feeling. It generally, when I say, oh, I'm a radio talk show host, they say, yeah, yeah, thanks, see you later. Because I don't think they want you to go on the air and talk about it, right? That would be the last thing they would, <laughs> they, they would really want. Yes, I'll be, I'll be talking about this on the air, well, as, as I am, as a matter yeah, of fact, free, right now. Free, free promotion for the justice system. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I'm hey, that's how Just I'm think of the exposure. <laughs> think of the tweets. Think of the, think of the tweets. <laughs> Think of the humanity. <laughs> this prosecutor has no idea what he's talking about. So uh, <laughs> I don't want to make this the lawsuit edition, but I don't know how we avoid making it the lawsuit edition. But you just came from jury duty. I mean, it just that. that. Well, first of all, Apple all lawyers succeeds. all the time. All, really? I mean, I'm. I, 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 I hate it that this. And it, and I have to. I have to say, if you haven't seen the um, This American Life on software patents, do see it because I think mm. it explains why. We, uh, tech companies now are spending so much time in court 
And I think all of that energy and money going to that is really just kills innovation, something awful. Apple uh, has now succeeded in literally stymieing sales of the uh, Galaxy Tab in Australia. Uh, this is via a negotiation, at least until legal proceedings uh, in that com country in Australia are resolved. So the court didn't do it. It was just part of the deal. They're not going to advertise the Galaxy Tab 10.1 in Australia. They're not going to sell it or until the court or the lawsuit or the court says you can and the lawsuit is resolved. This is the kind of thing Apple wanted to have happen in the U.S. for all Galaxy devices, including the phones and the tablets. They got the um, International Trade Commission uh, to, uh, to say, yes, yes, there's something wrong here. But it remains to be seen if they'll be able to get that stopped. And then HTC... Yeah, it's hard to get to the... Go ahead. I was just going to say, it's hard to get to the bottom of it because uh, Samsung subsequently said that they don't believe that these proceedings are going to delay expended, uh, ex extended rollout into the Pacific and Asia. So on the one hand, they're saying that they're going to cooperate with Apple to try to resolve whatever issues they have. On the other hand, they're trying to tell stockholders, believe me, we have over 800 pre-orders and we will be shipping <laughs> off, maybe a thousand of these. That's so. the truth, isn't it? That it really doesn't hurt them that much to not sell the thing because yeah, I mean, it's not been selling anywhere. I wouldn't BlackBerry love to have that excuse to say, oh, well, we were going to take over the entire industry this year, but, oh, we had to delegate this lawsuit, so 2012, I guess. Yeah. Now, HTC, who's also being sued, it was HTC that the ITC said was guilty of infringing of Apple's patents. The chief executive of HTC, Peter Cho, says it's a mere distraction. At an investor conference Friday, he says the company will grow revenue. We're confident that we will not be affected by Apple's lawsuit and um i guess they feel like they're going to win this one i imagine samsung does too or they wouldn't have agreed to the delay huh? i guess i would say it's a big distraction not to be able to, uh, heck, no you cannot call it a distraction well and i think that one of the things about it is is that it it i think the challenge for a lot of android manufacturers is if these are successful once you have uh, legal precedents, um, it's going to cause a lot of trouble for right. uh, everyone. Um, well, and that's the, the I, usually platform. with patent trolls, that's the strategy. You usually go after the low hanging fruit and get a few decisions under your belt, which gives you both money and precedent. And then you can go after the bigger and bigger ones. And ultimately, it feels, it feels to me like Apple would like to go after Android itself via Google. Well, my question, my, my question is is Apple going to try to just stop sales or are they going to try to get royalties? I mean, because there's. Well, in the long run, that's what they want, right? How much per handset do they get? Now, from Microsoft, from I mean, right. they're, they're, they would like to just have you know an extra hundred dollars a handset from all these <laughs> right. all these Android companies, right? Why not? Right? Uh, isn't that usually where these are going? Uh, I mean, I, I think that Apple's thing is they don't want anyone else to do it. I mean, I, I think that they I don't think that they necessarily I think whatever royalty they're they don't give care them, about the license. They're yeah, not going to think yeah, so. Yeah, I, I don't, think they make I don't so think much Apple's money. really interested in the royalties. Yeah, they they make so much. It money just doesn't on their sound handsets. like Apple. So, Adam, you're 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 thinking that. Um, Unlike most patent cases, this isn't about getting a license fee. You and you and uh, yeah, I I don't think so. I mean, I mean, if you if you just if you just look at what Apple's done over the years, they're really interested in making their money by selling their products. Right. That they don't really they don't want to they don't want to do bundling deals. They want to do marketing of other stuff. They just want to sell what they make and. You know, I'm I'm sure if there there was sort of no alternative but to you know either get the royalty money or not, they'd take it. But I just don't see that as a major aspect of Apple's business model. You certainly don't hear them talking the you know, on the analyst calls about all the money that they managed to get from their patent portfolio. Well, yeah. in that case, also, they're going also, for they, for blood, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, no, Apple wants blood. There's clear. <laughs> Well, most of their most of their patent work, uh, patent filings, they, they haven't been doing that sort of BS sort of. Well, we hold, we hold a t patent on on block by block bit shift technology for compressed stream network video, and because you stream some video, we you owe us money. They're mostly going after. Uh, they're, 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 every time they've, they've gone after Samsung, for instance, it's always been, your phone looks way too much like an iPhone. We need you to knock that off right away. That's the uh, rhetoric. The other stuff. Yeah. Well, that's the, or at least the, it, I, I've been talking to a couple of IT lawyers because this is way, way, way above my head, uh, and they said that there's a way that you position yourself strategically. They, they really, both of them were talking about this as though it were a military action. Right. 
<laughs> and saying there are, there are ways you deploy your weapons if you are aggressively trying to make this a revenue bearing sort of thing. And then there are the ways that you you deploy your weapons when you just want to make sure that you can protect your own company against incursions from uh, uh, from other patents. So far, it looks like they're mostly saying you can't make stuff that we think is or, or we think customers will think are knockoff of our technology. Also, you can't try to come after us with your patents and in a way to try to get us to buy you off because uh, we're going to try to make sure we slap you down pretty quickly there. Well, I, I, I'm not going to pretend I understand all this. This is just what other... <laughs> again, sometimes I have seeing eye nerds that explain things that are above my prey grade, and that's what they've been telling me. Well, and, pur and purportedly, I mean, App yeah. Apple... Uh, pur purportedly, Apple has done this before where they're not really trying to uh, make money on the royalties, but they are trying to slow the rest of the industry down. You know, they get ahead by innovating. You know, Firewire, you know, the, the, the scuttlebutt about Firewire was that Apple ch started charging for uh, Firewire after the camera companies had already adopted it, and all the PC manufacturers didn't. You know, they didn't adopt Firewire because they, because they didn't want to pay that $2 per unit royalty, which would have ended up be a $50 increase on, on PCs, you know, by the time it re reached the reseller. And what that did is it wasn't good for Firewire in the long term, but in the short term, Apple took over the video market because, they, because suddenly that was the easy way to plug your, you know, your camera into your computer and, you know, uh, USB didn't really work. It never, never has. For, for that type, for live streaming or live input. Adam, did you want to? Yeah, I was going to say, this has changed a little bit from, uh, you know, a while back when, when, when we, what you used to see more with the large companies was that they'd, they'd end up doing, um, they'd kind of get up together in a room and almost play a game of war with their patent portfolios. It's like, oh, I've got this one and that beats this other one. And they just keep piling them on and, and then kind of at the end add up, you know, who was in charge and come up with some sort of settlement. I mean, that's what we saw, I don't know if you remember way back when, when uh, they, uh, Microsoft paid Apple $150 million and there was this broad patent uh, sharing because of it. That was sort of the, you know, the end of the game of war was that Microsoft was down $150 million and so they they, they, they anteed up and everyone was happy. But what's the end game and, here? HTC and uh, Samsung yeah. stop making phones? Yeah, well, see, that's the only thing they can... How does a smartphone not look like this? <laughs> I mean, what does it look like? What, what, uh, it's going to be portrait mode. It's going to have a touch screen that's black. Um, it's well, in, in, in the Samsung action. In the Samsung action, they were more concerned about things like uh, the the, do the dock-ish icons that they had uh, with the Galaxy Tab. They're more concerned about look, you've got a a, a, ta a something that from the front looks exactly like a first-generation iPad. Uh, you turn onto its side and suddenly it looks like a wedding cake, but on the but from the front on, uh, screenshots can make it look that way. Uh, if you go into the Samsung's website, once again, they've sort of adopted, it, it is a honeycomb tablet, but they've sort of adopted that sort of strip of docked icons at the bottom that people tend to associate with an iPad. Uh, so that's largely what they're going after, I think. So that, that's You're an right. easy it, thing it, to it fix, is though, cool. isn't it? I mean, that's all you have to do to fix that is uh, redesign yeah. your icons. They could hire Kai Kraus. Yeah. <laughs> how hard? How hard is Photo that? Photo goo. <laughs> I don't get the feeling that Apple would be satisfied with a change in the uh, icons. Well, I think that for Apple, I mean, all of these lawsuits slow everybody down. I think that's that that's is the, the real it doesn't, purpose. They don't have to win. They just have to keep everybody in uncertainty. They have to have people not. They have to have consumers not sure whether this is gonna whether this is gonna be a viable platform they're getting onto. Right. Has it worked, have, by the way? Uh, Android is now 50% of the market world, smartphone market worldwide. <laughs> so it hasn't completely uh, worked. Maybe it will work. But when you look at the profits that Apple's making on, the, on theirs, they're now two-thirds of the... Yeah, profits, profits are fine, but I don't know if they're slowing down Android sales particularly. Well, and also I gather there's, the Android sales are really high, but there's also a huge returns. Is that true? So the... Yeah, people, I forget, that was a couple of weeks ago, I read something about how, you know, some, you know, 20% to 30% of Android phones were actually being returned, really? as opposed to like 1.7% of Apple phone, uh, smartphones. Well, that's interesting. So th that activation, the half million activations a day that uh, Google touts, well, you got to subtract, uh, f you know, 100,000 for returns. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Yeah, it was it was it was kind of a big deal because I mean, they say you get the phone, you get home, you're not happy with it. I think a lot of people back. find it too complicated. I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually I want to Adam I'm just looking yeah. at this 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 Android return numbers comes from TechCrunch, and uh, they're quoting. It's it's an article in TechCrunch from John Biggs who's quoting a person familiar with handset sales. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm okay, not, I'm not sure I buy this. And, and then and then uh, you know uh, I can't. It was a Business Insider 
uh, wrote, well, you know, I, I find that number difficult to believe uh, uh, because, actually it's a, a consumer electronics executive writing for the Pudong Daily, <laughs> saying, I don't know what that is. Yeah. I'll tell you, I love this business because these sources are so different. The, you know. the Pudong Daily, I mean, I go there every morning. Yeah. Well, it's obviously a Chinese, probably a Taiwanese uh, a newspaper. But he says, from my experience, retailers will complain and ask for compensations if the return rate's higher than 5 or 7%. Who would sell a phone if it had 40% return rate? That you, would, you, yeah. just wouldn't, you just wouldn't want to be in that business. Uh, and, it, you know, it's a pain for everybody. So I, we don't know what the Android return rates are. I'm, I, would, I would guess, though, that uh, they're higher than 1.7%, which is the uh, Apple return rate. I'm sure they are. Yeah. Because I know people who bought Android phones on my recommendation who said, I can't figure it out. It's too complicated. And the thing is, the iPhone is the gold standard. It's a geeky, I mean, it's a geeky phone. I think that That's I'm... That's why I like it. I'm waiting for the Galaxy 2S to come out because I'm going to get Well, one. you know who has one. I know, is, uh, is I know. It's a beautiful phone. I'm waiting for the iPhone 4S to come out, or whatever they call this one. Now, maybe not in uh, September. Now, the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. is saying, oh, no, our sources say October. Yeah, but they're talking the Pudong Daily, too. So. <laughs> uh, I, think it's, I think it's pretty clear that <laughs> iOS 5 and iPhone 5, or the next iPhone, we should just call it that, will come out at the <laughs> same time, probably. Sometime between September 15th and the end of the year. <laughs> you got to do it before uh, Christmas yeah. sales, right? Uh, yeah. I, was, I would think they'd hope, hope for back-to-school sales, but I guess not. So, uh, but remember, that they, they did promise iOS 5 in September. They didn't say fall. Okay. So, so you wouldn't think they'd come out with a... Maybe they'd announce the phone in September, but it, available October 5th or something like that. Yeah. John, John uh, Pachowski... Actually, it's all things D, not the Wall Street Journal. John Pachowski says, it's going to be an October surprise. Sources with knowledge... I'm so <laughs> sick of these. Sources with knowledge of the situation uh, say that those other sources who claim Apple's blacked out employee vacations... <laughs> in the last two weeks of September, are misinformed. So it's a fight between the unnamed sources now. Where's the Pudong Daily to weigh in when you need it? We need the Pudong Daily. Yeah, yeah. It's the the yeah, armor of all rumor. I think yeah. one way or the other, we're going to get an A5-based iPhone, maybe a curvy little swoop. It looked like the Samsung. You know, this, I think, is why Apple's <laughs> all upset about the Samsung phones. Because it's closer to their, I, their next iPhone. And this is why Samsung, remember, demanded a look at the next iPhone. I think Apple, in this case, is copying the slightly curved screen of the Galaxy uh, S. So who knows? <laughs> who, but who stole from whom, we don't know. I'm so glad. We're, we're, I think we're done. Are we done with, uh, with unnamed sources and court dates? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. For now. <laughs> for now. Jeez. Andy Anako is just here a, from the Chicago Just don't hit Sometimes. refresh on appleinsider.com. <laughs> I know. And we can move on. <laughs> and there's another lawsuit. And another. And another. And by the it's way. Great big target. As long as we're talking, quote, all things D and, uh, and uh, Apple, uh, iPhone sales, Apple did oust Nokia as the world's largest smartphone vendor. Here's the, uh, the graph, which I misread last Sunday on Twit. Apple is the blue, 18.5%. Nokia is 15.2%. But look, look, lo and behold, look who is number two. It's not Nokia. It's Samsung. I had no idea they were that big. They are the number two smartphone vendor worldwide. That's why Android's doing so well, because, of course, all of their handsets are uh, Android. And that's why Eileen is so happy, because she has Samsung. <laughs> and then 48% are other. Not that's Nokia. That's an awful lot of other. I know, yeah. Not Nokia, not Samsung, not Apple. HTC, LG, uh, Motorola, all have to be in there. All, by the way, all Android. So one thing you know well, about Apple is there's no other source of Apple iPhones, unless you go well, to the, China. <laughs> they have whole stores. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, all right, we're going to take a break. Thank you, Andy, for uh, joining us today. Andy is the uh, guy in charge of the Chicago Sun Times, and. Uh, you, you didn't go to. You didn't go to. If yeah, you got, he runs the whole place. Problems, but call me. I'll make sure the kid hits hits the front <laughs> doorstep, but not the puddle. He he is the man in charge of deliveries at the, <laughs> the Chicago Sun Times. He runs the Paperboy Corps. Do they still have Paperboys? I guess they do. Uh, Most, mostly, someone. they're paper men who can throw things out of the, the passenger sides of their windows. So it seems in this area, it's people driving very old cars, burning oil. Because I know, because I hear it in the morning. <laughs> uh, also with us, Adam Angst. Tidbits, T-I-D-B-I-T-S, 
Bookshop.com. You can read online or get it in your mailbox every week, which I do. But no papers, I'm sorry. No papers. We don't throw anything. You yeah. do not have paper boys. We do, we do not have paper boys. <laughs> or men. Or women. No, it's just all electronic. you got to go electronic these days. You know days. what we should do? We should do sometime, maybe uh, not this time, but next time we'll do this whole thing via go to meeting. Have you seen the new HD faces? Did I show it to you? I haven't seen it. <gasps> I haven't seen it. I saw, I saw the copy, and I was going to try to get it all working out, but I, it, it, it is you know, this awesome. Is, this is one of the big reasons we were doing some of our classes without GoToMeeting. Because um, no we, video. Because we do tons and tons of classes and tons and tons of meetings um, in GoToMeeting. Uh, but we were like, there were a handful of them, like, oh, we really want to see a person. And so we would go back to faces. When I saw this, I was like, oh, this is... Well, imagine, uh, and you could try this free. I'm going to tell you how in just a second. But imagine like a Google Hangout with six people, except that everybody's high def, looking really good, it tra really transforms online meetings. It's, you know, we were talking about how much a Cisco video conferencing yeah. system could cost, tens of thousands of dollars. Go to meeting, $49 a month, as many meetings as you want, as long as you want, and now with video, their new HD faces. It just increases the effectiveness of your online meetings. You can see facial expressions. Uh, you could put the faces, I like them up at the top because I wanted it by the uh, camera so that when I looked at them, it looked like I was looking into the camera, but you can put it on the side. And of course, the rest of the screen is occupied by the presenter's screen. That's what GoToMeeting's always done so well, using that Citrix remote access backend. So you have screen sharing. Any of the presenters can share their screens. You've got video now. You've got both teleconferencing and VoIP. Oh, of course, if you're using the video, you're going to use the VoIP, which makes it so simple and so simple to set up a meeting. We, I think we have more online meetings because of it. I mean, it's just an email, every, you know, invitation. Everybody clicks accept. You've got it when, you know, the alarm goes off. You've got the phone number if you need it. You've got the website. You just click that link, and boom, you're doing it. Now, everybody's got cameras, so all you need is a webcam and, uh, of course, uh, Internet access, and you're going to have video in your meetings. It's incredible. For sales presentations, for training sessions, weekly status meetings, all right from your desk, try it free for 30 days. It's very simple. Visit gotomeeting.com, click the Try It Free button, and use the promo code MACBREAK, and you'll have 30 days free. And, you know, just for the sake of trying it out, if you want to see super crisp video, go to meeting.com, click the Try It Free button. The offer code is MACBREAK. I think it's six people at a time. We should, we'll do one. You know what? Next, for next, next show, we'll do one. I'll just show you what it looks like. It is, it is beautiful. They've really licked this whole uh, video conferencing thing. And I think they've turned it on its head. Go to meeting.com, Try It Free button. Use the offer code MACBREAK. We thank Citrix. Uh, for their long, ongoing support of this. I think they're one of our uh, top advertisers on this show. So not only is Apple now the world's largest smartphone vendor, they also have two-thirds of, <laughs> you were just alluding to this, of the mobile phone profit. <laughs> so uh, this has actually been true since 2008. This graph is a little cluttered. Well, but it's a crazy thing to look at. If you look at the blue areas in that in that graph, there's like, well, Apple didn't exist back. You know, you, you right. suddenly see this blue just growing in like 2007. It goes. Well, no, that, yeah, yeah. But here it's nothing, right? Right. Nothing, 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 nothing big. This is this is after the launch of the iPhone one, and then bigger, then bigger, then bigger, then bigger, then bigger, then bigger. That's pretty impressive. Where's the key? Who else is on this? Uh, You've got HTC and. RIM and Samsung and Nokia. Get this. Nokia, Motorola, Sony, Ericsson, and LG all lost money selling phones in the most recent quarter. But they all, made up for it in volume. That's, those are the guys <laughs> down... Yeah, right. Those are the guys down below the line. These are the companies that lost money. Wow. That, and, of course, that ca that's because of Apple taking it out of their pockets, basically. Reaching in there, say, give me, give me this money. Ah, I got your money. Well, and I think that part of it is, is a certain if you don't sell enough of them, then the startup cost doesn't doesn't necessarily uh, pay for the factories and the fabrication right. processes and everything It's expensive else. to make them, right? Um, yeah, and as well as one of the things that Apple's been very good at when we talk about those cash reserves is being able to buy so much in bulk that they're actually able to reduce their costs. So for every, someone else to get the same feature set, they have to um, spend more money and, and have a much, much smaller margin. I saw an article on that saying, uh, uh, was it iFixit? I think it was iFixit who said, you know, if you compare the Samsung Galaxy Tab and the iPad 2, uh, you know, superficially they look very similar, but you can right. tell when you take them apart that Apple just controls the chain and makes this beautiful thing, and the Samsung Galaxy Tab is just kind of like, yeah... You know, well, it's kind of thrown together, I guess, is what they're saying. Well, when you don't have that, when you don't have that headroom, and when you don't have the you ability can't compete. and that level of control, yeah, yeah, 
You can't compete against it. Um, big story this week kind of brought tears to a lot of people's eyes. AT&T finally said, if you, are you, any of you, I'm sure you all have grandfathered yes. unlimited access, yep. right? And he well, does. I, I actually don't. Sorry. You don't? You didn't uh, like do everything you could to preserve that? No. So the simple fact of the matter is, is that I'm not out and about that much. So you didn't I'm care. on Wi-Fi pretty much all the time. Right. So you didn't yep, care. So I, I didn't care. Save, save a few bucks a month. And, you know, we're on the family plan trying to, I mean, basically the simple fact of the matter is that uh, there's a lot of people this is true of is that I don't use the iPhone to make calls much. I don't use the iPhone to use a huge amount of data when I'm out. I do want it using data whenever I'm out, just about. Right. But, you know, 200 megabytes, not a problem. You know, I do not go out to, go out to you know, lunch and watch a movie or something. I, you know, You're I'm saying out. you can you can get it by with 200 megabytes a month, Adam? Oh, trivially easily. Really? <laughs> I think I do that yeah. every day. Yeah, I don't even know. <laughs> I think my see, email, think, fetching wow. my email yeah. does that. <laughs> see, the thing is I'm not doing this stuff when I'm out. Right. When I'm out, I'm doing other things. You so work at I'm, home. When I'm using the bandwidth, right, I'm on Wi-Fi. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of Wi-Fi around, too. So, you know, like if I'm at Cornell, right. I'm on, all, on the Cornell Wi-Fi network. So it's just, it's been one of those things where only, I can only come close to the 200 megabytes when I'm traveling and using stuff pretty heavily. Well, that's so, actually kind of what AT&T is saying. And, I, you know, yeah. I, and I, I, I'm torn on this because it's really true that... Uh, we're all demanding more and more bandwidth online. I mean, I mean, I can, I mean, you know, out out, out there in the real world, uh, yes. and uh, and I can just imagine how hard it is for these companies. Uh, I read a very interesting article that said really the problem goes back to AT and T not buying enough of that 700 megahertz spectrum when the spectrum auction happened. Remember, we went to digital TV and the and the UHF spectrums that the television digital analog television stations were using got sold by the FCC what was that 3 or 4 years ago and Verizon and AT&T got the lion's share but Verizon bought twice as much as AT&T. And now they're saying this is coming back to bite AT&T in the butt because they are going to be in a bandwidth constraint situation whereas Verizon with twice as much of that 700 megahertz prime spectrum uh, can implement their LTE, can be faster. And in fact, this, this is what you're seeing now. AT&T has said, yes, we, you know, we have unlimited plans, but if you are in the top 5% of our users... And terms, they won't tell you what that means. Well, that's the problem. Now, what is that? Extraordinary. Is, <laughs> yeah. You're, you, I mean, that could be 3 gigabytes for all we know. We don't right. know what that is. You'll know when they clamp you down. October 1st, they're going to start slowing you down. Well, but here's the question. Will you yeah. actually know? Because 3G bandwidth is one of those things that's a little hard to, to know how much you're getting into. You, you may not. You may just say, yeah. boy, this sucks. In fact, yeah. it may, all that may happen is, boy, I hate AT&T even more now. Right. Well, for me, it makes well, it a lot. Go ahead, Andy. It's, it's, if, if you read the, the, the terms that they're proposing, it's not so much that they're going to punish you for using more than two gigs. It's more like if, it's tr if it really looks as though you're one of those people who, even if there's Wi-Fi available, you're streaming Netflix, 24 hours a day just to <laughs> just to stick it to the man uh, at some point they're going to start throttling you down after a warning and even if they do throttle you down it's not that that's going to be a month-to-month -month thing you start all over again the next billing cycle so it is those it, interestingly only throttling the people with unlimited yes right. it, it, it really is it, it, it really is uh, i think uh, and i a way to make sure that people aren't simply abusing their abusing the 3g network uh, when they could be using Wi-Fi, uh, because you look at some of the numbers on how much usage of even cable bandwidth is being u given over to streaming services like Netflix, and yeah. this is something that's really, really, really worrisome. You add on the Hulu app, you add on the HBO Go app, more and more mobile devices uh, on multi uh, multi platform mobile devices are designed to do nothing but stream video, stream video, stream video, and if they don't put some sort of a, a plan into place to at least say that there are circumstances under which we may not want to have you transact 40 gigabytes worth of data in one month, uh, we're, uh, then that's kind of a natural evolution of the service. In their email, AT&T says this is for users who use an extraordinary amount of data. They still don't say what that is in a single billing period. They say you can send and receive thousands of emails, surf thousands of web pages, and watch hours that could be two, three, four hours of video every month and not be in the top of our day. Well, I'll tell you why I care about this. If you watched, how much, actually, let me ask the chat room. If you watch Twit Live, let's say you watch the, the good quality megabit stream. 
how long before you would go through, what, five gigabytes? Pretty quick, like a week, if you watched it all day. And we certainly want people to watch, but, you know, I think if you're on a 3G network, it would be prudent to watch the 400 kilobit stream. Mm -hmm. It'd be prudent maybe to listen to audio instead of watching video. Yeah, I remember a little while ago when I was watching, when I had my uh, 3G uh, MiFi base station, uh, watching uh, watching Netflix on Amtrak, I was transacting about 150 megabytes per hour. So it's not as though I could even burn through an entire two gig stream if I were using it just for here's two here's two or three hours, which I'm going to be uh, free from all Wi-Fi, but I want to be entertained. Uh, so it's I don't I don't think it's an unreasonable cap, especially if as AT and T is hinting, it's not going to be a simple. You've used two gigabyte, two gigabytes plus one kilobyte. Congratulations! We're, you're now on to right. v dot v dot thirty two bis uh, data speed. But, but in some ways, wouldn't it be easier though to be able to to have it uh, to give us a number saying that it's going to be uh, well, three gigs or we four gigs? Know. I, then then you can sit there the and manage five. it, and oh, then right. you know what, when, when you're going to run into that, and you can manage your your experience. Well, I think well, it's odd like, that they don't say the number. Well, I'll bet those you, numbers like will start to be coming a hard out. Cap that would you like there to be a hard cap that doesn't change month to month? Or would you rather there be some flexibility uh, for AT&T to say, he really, he really, really put the hammer to the bandwidth this month, but it turns out that the past three months he's been actually under the two gig cap. We're not going to cut him off I after five. I'd rather have certainty. I I'd, think rather, it's, I'd rather know. It's marketing. It's, they don't want to stop saying unlimited. And in fact, well, they, they say if, if speed is more important, you may wish to switch to a tiered usage plan where customers can pay for more data if they need yeah. it and will not see reduced speeds. I may, I may wish to switch to Verizon. This is AT&T's, I think this is their buyer's remorse. I think this is the regret that they have in allowing Unlimited to continue. Well, Verizon doesn't have unlimited anymore either. Right? Nobody does. Yeah, but but you can actually use the data. I mean, the, the, oh. <laughs> you know, the, the, if I'm gonna okay. if, if they're gonna slow me down, I mean, it's already slow. It's already a mess. If, if AT and T was giving me great service and fast service, and they wanted to charge me more for that, okay, we can we can have that discussion. But the you know, if I'm in San Francisco or New York or Los Angeles or Las Vegas, um, you know, I'm not sure if my phone is going to work, you know, yeah. voice or otherwise. And and so given that, and and if if, if the unlimited was the only thing that AT&T Ex had in its advantage for me. Except this is at and is responding to that, if you think about it that way, by saying, oh, you know, we can't keep Alex on online, so we're going to kind of hit these bandwidth hogs so we can give everybody else better service. It's, it's for you, Alex. Yeah. They're doing it for you. Yeah, well, th all I'm saying is now it's, e it's easy. I'm looking forward to the new iPhone. I'm not saying that I'm leaving AT&T. Oh, you won't? You won't I'm, go to Verizon? I'm not sure. I'm just going to, I'm waiting for the new iPhone and I'm going to make a decision then as to, you know, my problem is I have a family plan. So I've got different iPhones starting at different times. I'm right. going to look at all this process. But, the, but I am definitely, it's much easier for me to have this kind of even, uh, you know, even discussion. I, I didn't even consider going to Verizon before because I was like, I'm not going to give up my un unlimited plan. You know, it's really unfortunate. I don't know what your experience boss in Boston is, Andy, or your experience, Adam, in uh, wherever the hell you live. But uh, <laughs> where, where are you? Philadelphia? I can never remember. Ithaca, New York. Ithaca. <laughs> it's, the, it's the only city with, in America with lisps. No, no, no. We, we actually moved here from Issaquah, Washington. <laughs> See, so that's not it, a lisp. <laughs> Centrally isolated, as the bumper stickers say. That's bizarre. You moved from Issaquah to Ithaca? Yes. That must have really confused your folks when you called and said, Mom, we're moving to Ithaca. You live in Ithaca. No, we're moving no, we from Ithaca to Ithaca. And we, we grew up in Ithaca, so it was, it was more oh, okay. confusing. Mom understood. <laughs> <laughs> in any event, I'd be very curious, because I think, unfortunately, AT&T really gets a bad rap because most of the tech press is in San Francisco, <laughs> where it truly does suck. But that's not necessarily at and You ever find yourself shaking yeah. your phone? It's very hard to get new uh, cell sites in uh, San Francisco. You know, it's a... Well, it's, that's, that's, why, that's, that's why it's difficult. It's, uh, the experiences are so subjective. In Boston, right. AT&T okay? almost always gives, gives me a really good signal. Yeah. The only time I was able ever to discern a real difference in performance between uh, accessibility between Verizon and AT&T was when my car broke down in the middle of I-95. Uh, and, and we're talking about, you know, New England where they just put rows right in the middle of of bombed out mountains uh, so the fact that i could get two bars on verizon and zero on at&t well okay that's nice trivia uh but if you go to new york i i've been to new york several times with verizon phones and at&t phones in my pocket neither one of them could give me any data even if they're give, showing me three or four uh, uh, bars of voice signal 
So it really depends on where you are, where you work, where you live. Uh, and I don't really care that someone's getting a great signal in wherever they live, so long as I can't get what I want where I live. <laughs> of course, i got to say San Francisco is the town where you can't circumcise your child, you can't buy a goldfish, you can't buy a hamster, but you can marry anything. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> we love Including your it. iPhone. And you, and you can smoke <laughs> marijuana on the corner. <laughs> yeah, that's why we love it. So the battle rages now, and this is related, over video over 3G. You know, FaceTime only works with Wi-Fi. Um, both, um, I mean, I think Apple would like it to work with 3G, but the question is, who's keeping it from doing so? And I would, I would submit it's probably AT and T and Verizon, right? That say, right. oh no. And in fact, we we also saw uh, Skype briefly come out, like for one hour, on the iPad. You worked with 3G, and then now it's gone. They said, oh, wait, 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 that was an error. But you have to think somebody called from Cupertino, right? <laughs> well, or or that the or someone called from Verizon. Not Cupertino, from Verizon. Yeah, yeah. AT &T, yeah. Right. If you ever want to work on our network again, right? Yeah. You will pull off. Otherwise, you will see severe right, package shaping. If, if Apple didn't want it, they would have just blocked it. Mm -hmm. The fact Apple wants this, right? Apple wants 3G video. Uh, so according to, this is a story in 9 to 5 Mac. In June, we reported that the fifth generation iPhone had reached its final testing stage. Within the report, we noticed that, noted that Apple and Verizon Wireless had yet to strike a deal for FaceTime video over 3G. Now, 9 to 5 sources have followed up to let us know progress on this situation. Currently, Verizon has many engineers testing 3G FaceTime in many regions with heavy iPhone usage. They're saying the quality looks fairly good. I think that's one of the things that's holding up FaceTime uh, uh, adoption is the lack of 3G. I think more people would use it if they could use it everywhere, right? Actually, if I can make an aside, Skype for iPad is back up. It's back. So maybe it was just a bad version. Here, download it uh, right now. <laughs> exactly. Let's it's get it on here. Now. Try it now. Switch, switch, put it right <clears throat> into the mix. Let's yeah, we the could put. We'll call somebody. We'll put. We'll hold it up and put them. Actually, we have the. We have I, the, I, the, I have the, the, the dongle. We can make it happen. Well, that's a question with FaceTime, though. Is it really the three G that's that's at issue? Um, uh, my suspicion is is that there that. It's not so much that people, oh, they want to do it over 3G, but that there's the big unknown if someone's going to be available. Or, you know, you sort of the, you have to know that and they're on Wi-Fi. And have their pants on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's the beauty of the iPhone. You can just sort of point it at the right <laughs> Just, hey, just uh, show, hold sorry. it up. <laughs> or down. Depending yeah, on your yeah, goals. Right. Yeah, it's the it's the wiener approach. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> He's talking about the House of Rep former disgraced <laughs> House of Representatives member. Skype is the next way to be, be disgraced. <laughs> so, uh, are you downloading? I'm downloading. It's it's it's, yep. it's almost I, so it's back. So I guess I shall take it out. I shall take it back. Um, do we know why they pulled it? So it abruptly? might have just been a bad something bad. That's thing. happened Skype, before. Well, Skype said that it had been released prematurely. Right. So, which, which happens to all of us sometimes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it does work with 3G. It does work with Wi-Fi. Um, well, and, and I do think, I mean, the rumor, one of the rumors about the, the next iPhone is that it is going to pretty much work on every network. I think Apple's idea of only working with one uh, manufacturer leaves them in the situation where they don't have a lot of leverage. But being able to have Sprint say, for instance, hey, you can use it whenever you want. It's all fine. Hello and welcome to Skype for iPad. Hello. It's the Skype Hello. lady. I love her. I'd like to let the Skype lady know that I'm in London in September. Too, Every app that must be run, there is an really element simple. of fun. Hi there. Hi, Hi there. You now get to experience Skype video calling is on the Skype biggest... Is Skype located in yet. Liverpool? So, what the hell is the deal? We built this version of Skype I thought they were Dutch. For the iPad. As well as being able to chat face to face, if you've got an iPad too, you can switch to the camera on the back to show what's going on around you. Let's do that. Like... My new trainers. Those are Very called sneakers nice. here in the U.S. You can also now instant message. What a loser! Google. He doesn't have a MacBook Air. He's got an old 2010 model. <laughs> <laughs> and all of your contacts are available at the touch of hey, a wait, button. They got her name right there. Right, I'm off now. Bye. Let's call her. Bye. Let's call. Her. We know who the you Skype lady is now. Skype to Skype calls to your friends on their laptops, mobile phones, or any other Skype-friendly device. I think the iPad is kind of a. Now that it has a camera on it, it's kind of a natural. You're using, your operator may charge you extra for using your data connection. Think about switching to a Wi-Fi network. 
Available now. That's probably they probably put that in there because that, maybe know. that's what they forgot to put on. Yeah, that is exactly yeah, that's <laughs> exactly it. Uh, we need oh, to have the message, the disclaimer. Rats, I thought you were going to handle that, Charlie. I thought you were going to handle that, Sally. <laughs> um. Anyway, it's in there now. <laughs> you should have Jason Stratham. <laughs> yeah, they should. That would be funny. If you need to talk to some real things, just <laughs> Skype them. That way the Russells won't find out what you're talking about because it's all cool. I like him. He's great. Uh, I, According to uh, the New Yorker, they have sold a huge number of uh, subscriptions on the iPad. 20,000 people. What were they charging? It's four fifty bucks. Twenty thousand people. I but just in, now uh, even more yeah. people. They made about one point two million dollars. They the even more people. Six fifty nine ninety nine. Seventy five thousand existing subscribers like me. I subscribe to the print edition. Uh, read it on, on our iPads. I love it because uh, I don't have to buy it separately anymore. It used to be five bucks. So uh, overall, then Condé Nast says we've got a hundred thousand readers on the iPad. That's 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 significant. Now it's small compared to their one million. It's so one-tenth of their one million print subscribers. Right. Um, also, you, 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 you kind of wonder how much they spent developing their New Yorker app, their, their iPad right. app, which certainly wasn't 10 bucks to some high school kid. No, it's nicely done. Although I imagine that Condi probably has a centralized app development team that can port this stuff. Because they've got the Vanity Fair, GQ, Wired, Glamour, Golf Digest, Self, and Allure all on the iPad. right? So, so it would make sense. Uh, although the New Yorker of all of those is the best selling, of course its readers are affluent, intelligent, and good looking. And good looking. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, they they've got content that works well within an ebook or an iPad. So it does. It's uh, long I, form. I, I, it's, it's 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 not the, it, it doesn't cost them a lot of money to get like a long photo or a video, right? Uh, a lo long long photo essay and reformat it so that it'll work on under right. multiple formats. So. No, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, it's just a natural, in fact. It's almost like getting a little novel every week. It's yeah. so long. Um, so, it, in fact, the iPads... It is like getting a little novel every week. It is. Week. I know. <laughs> I can, let's be I real can, here. I, it, it's, a, it, it's a guilt inducer for me. I never... I, it's like getting the Sunday Times. I oh, just, yeah, yeah. I just look never, at it and go... Eh. I can't uh -huh. decide whether the New Yorker's worse than the Economist for me that way. Yeah, same thing. It's just, you know, both of them. You're just like, oh, do I have to read all that? I think that's I the, the secret to uh, uh, tablet sales is that a tablet version of the magazine is less guilt-inducing. It's just a, it's more of a yeah. reference work then, or something you yeah. can search, or, you you, and you always piles. have it. And Yeah, you don't have big piles. Mm. I actually, yeah, I, I find it, uh, certain magazine structures, so like flip, Flipboard, um, I and Flipboard. Yeah, Flipboard, I think, is the best oh, way amazing. to look at any, any, anything on the iPad right now. Um, you but can also, actually subscribe to the New Yorker on the Flipboard. You don't get the... Oh, really? Well, you don't get the... Li not paid subscription. You get the, just right. the stuff they put on the web, but it's great. It's awesome. And, yeah. and but, but I find it interesting with both Flipboard and with the Daily, um, those two specifically, I don't feel like... I don't even know how to get to the history, like to old stuff. So I, I always... Ha it really becomes this thing like I'm just going to dip in and grab on to whatever data I'm going to read today, and then tomorrow it'll be something different. And I think that that takes some of that pressure off feeling like I have to finish it. Because exactly. I know that when I get an economist... Now I've learned it. It's, it's, I buy Economist right before I got on flights, and I read them on the, yeah, on the way I, I up and on the way down. Yeah. And then you throw it out. No, I just leave it in the, in yeah. the seat for somebody yeah, yeah. else. I'm like, I'm not even taking it out because right. I'll feel like I have to read it. No, this, I, that's what I mean. I think that iPad sales potentially are huge for magazines that are guilt-inducing, like The Economist yeah. and like The New Yorker, like The New York Times, like The Wall Street Journal. I think those are, those are the magazines that are going to benefit. Vanity Fair, People Magazine. You go, eh. Wired's sort of the same for me. Same thing. Wired is guilt-inducing. Guilt yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, it's sort of for work. I should I read it. it. I should read it. It's much yeah, easier yeah, to read, though. Wired is much easier to read now because they made it so many small articles. I can actually... <laughs> you know, like, it's, no, it's not like... There's only, like, one or two really long articles instead of, like, most of the magazines. You can just kind of skim a lot of it. Yeah. Much, much better. Can you... Um, Adam, have you looked at maybe making an app for Tidbits, or is it just does not make sense for you? We actually have an app for Tidbits. It's a very oh. simple app. Uh, okay. It is free, and anyone can download it. And uh, it's on the iPad. It looks a lot like mail. What was your so, thinking there? Why, why did you do that? Well, uh, one of our staffers is a, is a developer, and he wanted to try it. So we, right. we did something simple. It's I mean, basically what it does is it sucks in our RSS feed. And so we wanted to do it as a way... 
mostly, honestly, for people who commute to be able to read tidbits offline. Mm. Because it's easy enough to do online stuff in a variety of different ways. And, and people get tidbits in email, so you, know, you, can, you can always do it that way, too. But if you're on a train somewhere and you're just totally offline on your iPad, for instance, um, you know, it's, it's a better interface. And so one of the rules we've also always said with tidbits is make it available in as many formats and uh, approaches as you can. So that was another one. Yeah, that's my attitude, too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, don't make people choose. Do you have uh, numbers? I guess you probably can't even track that. You know, you have some numbers, but not. It's, it's not gotten a huge number of downloads or, you know, huge readership. But it's also really simple. Right. Um, right. You know, we were looking at ways of, of being able to build it in so you'd be able to search the archive and, you know, if you were online and um, bring other apps into it and whatnot. But, you know... There's a certain level of how much effort do you want to put into a free app that's not going to make you any money. And it's a universal iPad and iPhone. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Well, I didn't even know that. But you're right, because, you know, I get the email, so I know it's on my device because yeah. cause my email's on yeah. my device. So it's easy for me to read that. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, um, you know what? Would somebody get my, um, my uh, iPad? It's on my desk. Maybe we can make a little, uh, you can call me and I'll call you. Yes. Be a little weird. <laughs> we could try it. We just see how good it looks. But first, I want to tell you about the painless way to send in voices that I discovered in 2004, thanks to the lovely and talented Amber MacArthur. I'm talking about FreshBooks. Painless invoicing. Focus on your work, not your paperwork, with FreshBooks.com. Nobody likes doing the invoices. You know, I'd get to the end of the year, and every time I get to the end of the year, it'd be like, I mean, end of the month, it'd be like, oh. Oh, I'm not going to get paid unless I send out invoices. And there's also this deferred gratification because you send out the invoice, and then a month later you get paid, maybe two months, sometimes three months later. So it's almost like, well, I'm not even going to bother. But this got all changed for me when I started using FreshBooks. First of all, it's it, you know you you give you put your lo your logo in, and you and and it it's just it's almost as as automatic as can be to create an invoice. If it's a recurring invoice, they'll they'll actually do it for you automatically. Here's a nice feature. You see this, this little checkbox that says PayPal there? Your clients can pay with a push button in the email. They can do a credit card, PayPal, authorized.net, 11 different payment gateways. So that means you get paid faster because, you know, there's less friction to the client paying. But when you set up the recurring bill, you can get your client to set up recurring payments, and then nobody has to intervene. This is happy for everybody. You just do the work and get paid. You can use any currency. That was good for me because I was working in Canada. You can send invoices by uh, mail as well if you want. For an additional fee, they'll print, stamp, and mail it for you. I did that with some of the more traditional clients because I knew they wanted paper invoices. If you use uh, time and hours billing, you, they have an iPhone app, or you can just do it on the web, and it will automatically take those time and hours and put them right into the invoice for you. And, of course, if they don't pay, automatically you can ding them every, you know, 30 days or whatever. And so you just you get paid more often. It's easier to do. And get this. It's free for the first three clients. How about that? I, I say free for three. Uh, if you decide you like it after you try the, the, the three, uh, if you want to do more clients, it's, it's very affordable. We're talking uh, 20 bucks for 25 clients they have different plans of course but free for the first three so no reason not to try it out go to freshbooks.com and sign up today and by the way yes i know you want the birthday cake they are still giving away a birthday cake to uh, somebody listening right now once a week it doesn't have to be your birthday <laughs> you just let them know you heard about it on mac break and uh, they're going to have a, a drawing among their new customers from mac break and, and one of you will get a birthday cake from FreshBooks. FreshBooks.com. Free for the first three. I love that. All right, I got my... So here's, oh, here's an interesting thing, Leo. Yes. You said that FreshBooks takes PayPal, and uh, I was looking at our, our Take Control eBooks uh, um, payment approaches uh, report recently, and I was shocked, just shocked, to see that over 60% of the people who are buying eBooks are using PayPal. Yeah, it's funny because there's this... Um there is some pushback yeah. against PayPal. We we only take donations from PayPal because yeah. it just was easier for me to set up, and I should set up all the other ones, and I just never got around to it. But but it does seem it like just works as for much the most as people, people don't as much as you hear bad things about PayPal, it does. 
I've used it for a long time. I, I pay a lot of uh, shareware fees in PayPal, a lot of shareware. Yeah. It's just easy for them to set up. But you have other systems or? Yeah, Accelerate, that's the company we work oh, with. Oh, Accelerate, know, they take yeah, all yeah. The, yeah. They take all the right. credit cards and everything. Right. And so it was just, it was interesting because I had always, they added PayPal, I don't know, four or five years ago, whatever. And 60%. I, 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 had, I had just, yeah, I didn't think it was that big a deal. And then all of a sudden, whoa, wow. I saw this report. But, you know, um, we saw this, that whole thing with uh, people being charged multiple times for Lion. Um, and oh, really? And there was some with PayPal. Um, seemingly, the app, the app Store had some problems. Oh. And so, but again, you know, apparently a whole lot of people paying for Lion on the App Store with, with PayPal. Thank you for stalling a little bit for me because I'm logging. <laughs> you did that very well. I'm logging into my, uh, my Skype on the iPad. Looks just like the regular Skype. Do you have yours? I have it. I don't have much battery left. I was playing oh. with it a lot before we started. Um, so this may let, I have it on my phone, too. Well, will this ch that won't charge it, will it? Oh, yeah, I know. I was looking, yeah. That's what I was looking for. While okay, you so I need to turn off Wi-Fi, first of all. Or should I? Should we try it with Wi-Fi? No, let's try it without Wi-Fi. Right. Let's try it because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked up to her very fast. We have a lot of Internet in here. Let me turn that off. Go to no. Verizon, by the way. Verizon 3G. Turn it back on. I just again. killed it. And uh, so what's yeah. your, I don't know what you're whispering in my ear. Uh, it's uh, a, <laughs> I, I can't hear a thing. Here, Wait just a minute. Let me, let me type ah! it in. I can type it in. Oh, yeah, you can type it in. So let me add you. Type it into a piece of plastic. I mean, I'm, uh, okay, so we're going to add Alex and we're going to make a call. This will be the shortest Skype call in history. You're about I don't know, it's already dead, two, but, I, but I, you can call my Two iPhone. feet away from me. We can go iPhone to, to yeah, iPhone. Yeah, yeah, iPhone would be good. Mm -hmm. So what's funny is, is I have the same problem. I, I had I had actually there a reasonable amount. I installed Skype and then it uh, okay. then I didn't have any battery. So left. I'm going to do a video call with you. Yes? Yes. All right. Connecting. So I'll show you what this looks Hello. like. Hello. We don't have a close-up. Well, we do have a close-up. Do we? Oh, my God. We are so professional. Connecting. I am connecting Alex Lindsay on my iPad. I brought this to... Uh, the jury room. I thought I'd be able to. They said, they said very clearly, we have Wi-Fi. Bring your notebook. And then they said, put your notebook away. <laughs> uh, it's connecting. Uh, what are you doing? I, I'm, I'm looking. I'm. Oh, wait a minute. I lost. I got a little dot. I'm lost my. Uh, but this is this is a great experience. I've lost my uh, my my 3G. Oh, so Verizon, I guess, is not as good as we all thought. Uh, you know, I have five bars on my AT and T. Just thought I'd let you know. I don't. I don't have any. Uh, do we not have Verizon in here? Is the Verizon connectivity bad? Okay, I'm going to ask our live studio audience. Please turn off your MiFi's. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, that was a you know joke. I don't know. I can't. Never I got mind. that joke. I thought it was very. You, funny you joke. laughed. Oh, now I'm recording something. Skype recording? What does that mean? Oh, you got the little circle? I got the red thing that says Skype is recording something. It's recording uh, you. You, you, you. I guess it's, it's good for as a recorder just, as well. What the hell? That, that just means that it has control of the camera. Oh, oh, okay. oh, thank you. I've never seen that before. So I have to hang up before I can uh, exit out. Hey, Dan, can I call you? Dan Hendricks, our chat guy, are you, uh, are you available? Should I call you? Do you have Skype running on your uh, computer? I don't have enough 3G. It doesn't matter. <sighs> that was a real waste of time. Just <laughs> Really sorry. Hey, speaking of waste of time, I guess I'll bring this up. Apple has more money in the bank than the U.S. government. Not true anymore. The U.S. government uh, got a loan, right? They printed more. Uh, they're still signing on it, I think. Well, they haven't signed it yet. So we're down to like, what, five bucks? <laughs> we're probably down to pretty low now. Uh, but Apple has $76 billion in cash. Actually, Bill Gates has more money than the U.S. government. <laughs> I want to know if they're counting the $1 billion the U.S. government has in dollar coins stored in the mint. Well, this is what we were asking on Twitter. Maybe you seem like a, one of those autodidact types that might actually know. <laughs> I think it's $11 billion worth of uh, gold. That's how much they have in, in Fort Knox. Fort Knox. You, you even Fort Knox. Knew, Alex even knew the question before I asked it. <laughs> so they have, they do have gold at Fort Knox. Yeah, I believe it's eleven, $11 million, billion dollars. Eleven billion dollars worth. Wow. Of gold. I, I, I have heard, to admit that something. 
I heard something incredible and wonderful that I hope I hope the government got so desperate they would actually do this. Turns out there's a loophole that says that yeah. they can't make up shortfalls by printing new paper money, but they can they on a side thing they are allowed to do as much as many platinum coins as they want. Whoa! So essentially, so essentially, if everything had fallen through, the U.S. <laughs> Treasury could have simply made no joke two or three platinum one trillion dollar coins. <laughs> and you uh, Depos uh, deposited them in their own bank, and then used those three trillion dollar coins as like, <laughs> and draw upon like that deposit to like run this, the government. Is this Andy? Is this one of those things that you know, like there's the president, then there's the vice president, there's the speaker of the house, yeah. and then you kind of work your way seventy five levels down. It's like the guy who's in charge of the mint can say, "We're going to print trillion dollar coins." <laughs> well, you know, it, the, 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 what they were trying to avoid and why they would have never done that is because <laughs> they would have started calling the United States government Zimbabwe North. Yeah, because the inflation, I mean, you know that that's what no, that's the hyperinflation, right? Yeah, it would have been. They would have had like the, the, you know, it would have been bad. I love the idea. Though. I think it's a great idea. And then the biggest, the biggest problem would have been the debate over whose picture gets to be on that coin. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I, I, I vote for Herbert Hoop. Herbert Hoop. <laughs> and then I get to be Doctor Evil and say we should invade Fort Knox and steal. I can't yes. turn around in this chair. The one trillion dollar coin. <laughs> and, then, and then suddenly, the, no, and then suddenly, a a a, a new movie starring probably the the modern either one of those Sarah kids, one of the kids from Glee, whoever the new Jack Black is, say the new hire at the Mint. He buys a buys a, he buys a soda at the vending machine. Realizes, <laughs> oh no, I, I the, just put the new trillion dollar <laughs> coin in the soda machine. I and think a there's a movie stuff. idea. I hope you're writing a script right now. I got, I got a spec script that's actually very similar to that. If Do I can get a, if I can get a if I can get a pitch meeting in with Universal, I'm sure that we can sell this. The trillion dollar coin. It's a Disney movie. It's great. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, you don't 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 let that one get stolen. That's all. I'm that's saying. a great that's idea. A, that's a, Pepsi, we get Pepsi and Coke, Coke like against each other to get the naming rights. It's Adam or, or Andy, do you know anything about this uh, super Wi-Fi? This eight hundred two dot twenty two. Yeah. So what's the story it's, there? The the idea was this was a standard that was proposed a few years ago to solve the problem of how do you get broadband into rural areas. So it is a super long distance version of Wi-Fi. Sixty can, miles. Right. Exactly. So you can basically build a little tower and essentially make sure that all these rural areas especially where, where it's, it's just not feasible to run cable or to run uh, run the network out there uh, you could just basically plop up this one thing put a couple dishes up and you'll have wow. you'll, you'll have coverage for this area especially for certain uh municipalities where a, co a data company is required to service any house that wants to have uh wants to have one of their services you can't just simply say we will only service the profitable areas of town the unprofitable areas we're not going to run cable out to so the i so they, they made the next step towards making this a real standard uh and so this a lot of people pick this up to say that oh well that's great that means that i can be anywhere within like three miles of my house and still have access to my home network well no because it really wasn't built it was, wasn't designed to be something where you just plug this into your cable box and then turn it on and look for the wait for the yellow light to turn green and you've got a network also it certainly wasn't designed you can't you can't have a, a, a transmitter of that kind of power in every single house or even every third house in a neighborhood and expect birds not to explode right. in mid-flight uh, in mid-air so. this is funny because this is what wimax was supposed to do was to provide you know kind of internet to rural areas that wasn't cost effective to run cable to. Well, it, the other thing, I, I, I mean, I, this is the first I've heard of this particular thing, but I actually ran a long-range wireless connection for, for a number of years. Highly and, directional, uh, right? You aim it. Yeah, yeah. Highly directional. You just, you know, you, well, it's not so much that it's highly directional. It's that you have to be line of sight. Right. Yeah. And so as long as you're within line of sight and, you know, you just point your parabolic antenna in the right direction and, want, you know, until you get your, until you get the, the signal right and, and then you lock it down. So, I mean, we were going mm, three miles or so. With uh, and that was one megabit wireless, um, eight hundred two eleven G. Uh, no, B. Sorry, hmm. <laughs> I have to go backwards. Wow, that's impressive. Uh, yeah, so it and, it and it just worked. I mean, it was not a, it was not a problem. So you know, I don't know quite what they're doing here. I'm sort of reading the article really quickly. They're not saying whether or not it's you know they're they're avoiding the the line of sight issues or again what the power issues were. We didn't have to boost power. I just cannibalized a, a Lucent Waveland card from an old airport base station and you know plugged it into a, a parabolic antenna, which sounds a little easier than it actually was, but. Um, you know, it yeah, well, work. we've yeah. seen hackers do that. Uh, in fact, yeah. DEFCON, they did, the, what, how many kilometers was it? I mean, they, they, they were getting yeah. 20 kilometers or something like oh, that. Oh, you can, you can go a long way. Yeah. It's just a matter of the power and the, and the antennas that you put in. This just in from Milnock in our chat room. 
There is a $1 million coin in Canada. In May 2007, the Royal Canadian Mint issued a gold maple leaf coin with a face value of $1 million. It's 100 kilograms of gold. Why did they do that? This is a mainly a promotional product. <laughs> it's, like, it's not a loony. It's not a toony. What's the name of it? That's, yeah. that's for the man who has everything. Yeah. 100 kilograms. You don't want it. That's too, over 200 pounds. If it's a million, pounds. it must be a moony. It's a moony. I like it. <laughs> yeah, we got a toony and we got a moony. Wow. <laughs> so thank you, Milna. So it's not the first time, uh, time they've done something like that. You couldn't fit that into a, a Coke machine, though. <laughs> I don't think. So, and by the way, I stand corrected. Uh, the um, According to the, the chat and according to Wikipedia, it's $228 billion worth of gold in Fort Knox, which I guess doesn't count <laughs> as, as liquid assets. I guess not, because Apple doesn't have that much. Yes. Wow. I guess this, art, this story is bogus. Yeah, because we're not tied to gold, and they're not liquid. You can't get it out. I guess you... What are you going to do with it? I've tried often. <laughs> <laughs> the new MacBook Air, we are now learning uh, from Anand Tech, uh, has a smaller, cheaper Thunderbolt controller, but it's <laughs> limited to a single external display. So uh, I think this is good news, though, that there are, there are a variety of Thunderbolt components. I mean, the idea that you can have a cheaper one um, means... It's sort of interesting. You, there's a cheaper one before there's more of a, like, a third peripheral. So Right. Right. You know, and the cables still cost 50 bucks. Yeah, that's just you outrageous. Know? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Maybe, maybe this will make its way into the cable, too, and that'll cable well, the, will come down the, to 30 bucks. The reason Anand says this is important is because it, it, PC makers are very price sensitive, as you know, and so they're not going to put Thunderbolt into PCs unless they can get a cheap chip. So this is the kind of thing that maybe PC manufacturers would use to make Thunderbolt a more universal standard. I think that would be great. Well, they also got a boost from Intel because now they've promoted a new standard. Uh, they, they, they essentially just looked at uh, the MacBook Air and said, hey, ooh, that's nice. I think we'll develop it as our own standard. So now they have a hardware spec called the Ultrabook ah. that is designed to be pretty much as close to a MacBook Air as you possibly can get. Ultra thin, uh, also using uh, also using Sandy, Sandy Bridge processors, uh, using SSDs for storage. Uh, and so when you get uh, – it's it's uh, the weird thing about Thunderbolt is that it's such a – broad stroke solution to a whole bunch of problems when you're trying to build something that's nice and thin but usable usable for so many things it is essentially like having a tower mac with a pci bus because it means that you can have pretty much any peripheral you want just by adding in a dongle uh, most people are not going to even care about having gigabit ethernet for instance on I a agree. macbook air or yeah. Yeah. but it means that if you do if you are one of those people who who are saying Gosh, I would buy that in a second, but I absolutely need to have copper Ethernet. Well, great, fine. Buy a 30, 30 40 fifty dollar dongle, plug it into your Thunderbolt port, and you will have gigabit Ethernet, or you will have, uh, or you'll have card bus, or you'll have pretty much anything you want because it's that flexible a standard. So, it's interesting. I, I do, I do think that it's a, it's a good horse to back. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm glad there was something to replace fire. I just want to see some drives. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of them. But yeah, I mean, we were going to see them by now, didn't we? Didn't we think we Promise were... Pegasus, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's Lossy, a... Sonnet. Uh, Lossy, Sonnet are the two companies that were really, really aggressive a few months ago, a couple months ago at least, and it's promising that you're not you're, we're going to have drives, we're going to have adapters, we're going to have network interfaces. None of them have, uh, as far as I know, have actually <laughs> shipped yet. So. How well is the uh, air doing? Remember they were saying, oh, we're going to have to ramp up production. We're going to send 17 million airs in the first sold quarter. Out. It's sold out? I, didn't, I think they're having trouble yeah, with... Uh, you, can get the, you, you can still get, if you want, the uh, like an 11-inch base, 64 gig, lower uh, 2 gigabyte memory air, you can get it on Amazon today. If you want the one that everybody wants, they're just saying two or three week wait. What is the one everyone wants? Is it the that's 13? The one, that's that's the uh, well. If just for the eleven, the eleven inch that has uh, four gigs, better processor. Right. And the That's the one I want. Yeah, yeah. Two gigs right. is not that enough. one. Is that one is two or three weeks wait? Interesting. Wow. Um, and the thirteen inch. I wonder how that's selling. Thirteen inches in stock. Okay, Mac Mall uh, has it. I, I will admit that I'm very aware of the availability of the eleven inch Air because are you I'm eyeing it? Moved, I've not. No, I've just. But now I've moved on to the. Well, if I. Did want one? How long would I have, <laughs> would I have it in time for this trip I'm making in mid-September? Did you buy? You bought the October uh, Air. Oh uh, no, I don't. I don't own any Air. Oh, models. you're again a smart guy because you put these things off. 
Well, not, not, not only that, but the Air didn't make a hell of a lot of sense to me before the 2011 editions. Uh, the addition of uh, the, the, yeah. the faster processors and also uh, the Thunderbolt port, which means that there's not going to be a point which this is going to be a failed machine for me. Right. This is not going to. I can. I will actually be able to use it for pretty much anything I want to use it for while I'm traveling. Uh, that's the, the 2011s are really a significant upgrade. Uh, I still have Apple's uh, right in the house right now. I literally have one of everything that Apple made in 2011 uh, all on loan, and I'm doing like a big mega. Here is the entire 2011 line. That's fun. Uh, roundup review, uh, and man, it is gonna be it's really. Pretty. It's it it is it's already going to be really hard to send all the stuff back because I'm literally going to have to put eight things boxed back up and take it down to FedEx. But I'm talking about the idea of oh well let's go to Panera and do some oh I have to use my 15 inch <laughs> MacBook. <laughs> no, Andy, Andy, the only thing I have to ask you about with these tests is how is that uh, Mac Pro treating you? Uh, which pro, <laughs> which Pro does he? Is that the eight way? Uh, Xeon? No, San later than this. <laughs> uh, Which the, one? The, every, everything that they've made in 2011. Everything they've released in 2011. <laughs> I have on my desk the uh, new <laughs> iMac. The, ice, and the it's 2011 ice. Mac Pro? I'm sitting in it right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get it. There isn't a 2011 Mac. Uh, well, I mean, I'm just, cool, I was trying to get him to call his dog. Much this hot weather. I get it. So they haven't released it yet, but the rumor is they're. See, I'm slow. We're just waiting. We're waiting. We're to, waiting. Uh, you moment. You're paying attention. Just, to I don't think Thunderbolt most Mac people Pro. are paying any attention to the Thunderbolt <laughs> Mac Pro. Yeah, no expansion bus. Oh, yeah, that's one. such a small, narrow yeah. slice. It is a bunch of trucks. You know, no one really cares. I'm really happy with this new iMac, though. I got the I got the solid state drive in there. Oh yeah. And the i7. It's very nice. I want to get some. Yeah. I'm going to get a Mac Mini. I think this week or next week to do Those some Those new tests. minis are sweet. Yeah. Yeah. That's especially when you have you, have you actually seen them yet. Uh, I have not seen them. They, they're very I, I think that, low profile. I think that Apple is, this is the first time with a mini that Apple is explicitly embracing the Mac mini as an embedded device. They, they still want, they still want to suggest it as a good replacement for your, whatever your, whatever desktop PC you have. Just take out this box, put in this nice trim little Apple box. But now they're much more explicit about saying, and if you want something to install on a car dashboard, and if you want something to drive a robot with, and if you want something just to use as a TV device, uh, we have this, that, you know, I think that's as much as anything else is one of the reasons why they deleted the optical drive and made it as small and inobtrusive as, as anything. It's like, it's like a big, uh, a hyperthyroid version of the Apple TV at this point. Speaking of which, you can now watch Vimeo uh, videos. Uh, software update on Monday added Vimeo capability to uh, to Apple. Also, um, you can stream. What is this? Uh, I mean, you, it, you can stream the, movies from the iTunes Store without a computer being on. Right. Right. It, 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 the, That's the weird that it didn't do that before. Yeah. It's it's interesting. It's interesting. Not not only that, but they've added something kind of new, where uh, uh, it used to be that if you didn't have if what, when you purchased a movie or you purchased a TV show, uh, it was it was like any other iTunes store purchase where you have to <sighs> keep good track of that because if you lose it, you lose it. Right now, it's anything you've bought in the past is available to you in your library and accessible by Apple TV. iCloud is uh, went online uh, today. The developer version, although uh, everybody probably went to iCloud.com and tried to log in. It's pretty, isn't it? I like this uh, dog tag. It's a metallic dog tag. I wonder if they're going to send you one. Send me what? <laughs> a oh, dog tag. a dog tag. I'd love That'd that. Awesome. That's like Steve Wozniak's business card, which he claims he can cut meat with. It's, 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 Here, it's, I have a business and card. You can cut meat with it. And that's exactly what he says. <laughs> I have one does at home. Gets, I'll bring it Does in. he get stopped by the TSA for that? Yeah. I mean, no. if you could cut meat with that, yeah. you could take a plane don't, over. He doesn't say that in front of TSA, I think. <laughs> but he, <laughs> he does have to put his wallet in the, uh, in the, in the little bin. Yeah. yeah. But it's a business card. What could, what could be possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> no, see, the, the scary thing with Waz is that when you have that much money, you realize that there's nothing I can't, no problem I can't buy my way out of. So... You know what? I think I'll just dress as, as John Belushi as the Saturday Night Live samurai right through the TSA gate, knowing that <laughs> two samurai swords, bleh, what's the worst they can do? Ten grand. Call the lawyer. So along with the release of the beta, we now have prices. I think very, uh, fairly aggressive pricing on uh, storage. The default free storage is five gigabytes. That's pretty much what everybody does. Uh, Ten gigabytes, $20 a year. I actually like this. You know, for it's like fifteen dollars a a month for 
50 gigabytes on Dropbox, and there's nothing in between. And I think this is a little more realistic. $20 for 10 gigabytes, $40 for 20 gigabytes, and this is per year, not per month. 50 gigabytes, $100 per year. So it's about half what Dropbox is And charging. your music doesn't count. Right. If and you buy music, doesn't it doesn't count. count. Right. Photos There's don't purchase. count for a month. Music never counts. So I think this is pretty attractive. And considering that Mobile Me used to cost 100 bucks and you get 20 gigs, it's a, it's a good deal. Not that I'm bitter. <laughs> <laughs> paid for it for years. Yes. I yeah. paid for the extras and the... Yeah, yeah. Mm. But the, you, it's, it's like supporting a local band when they're just in Harvard Square selling cassette tapes. You allowed them to keep at it and keep the we dream did. alive we until the dream they made it big. And now it's five hundred dollars, and you can't afford to go. We're we're glad we just provide Apple with an income stream so that they can well, continue to, to do what they do. They're just cash trapped, you know. You you want to <laughs> yeah, keep on need the money. money at them, yeah, exactly. I it's, understand the iPad three is going to be a Kickstarter project. It's yeah. as if those <laughs> it's as if those Harvard Square buskers had seventy six billion dollars, but they didn't want to spend it. So we, we, we well, they, they, most mostly most of the buskers in Harvard Square are trust fund kids. Yeah, they couldn't <laughs> they couldn't get uh, they couldn't get the local McDonald's to break. That thousand dollar bill. So give me a buck, so I can yeah. buy a Big Mac. Um, has how has it been uh, with people? Uh, I presume you're all using Lion. Compatibility issues. I know Office, for instance, is uh, is, is has some issues with uh, Microsoft Office, but it's not going to be updated for a few months. Um, I was worried about that, and then I realized, oh wait, I don't actually <laughs> use Office. I bet you nobody here does. I know you use BB Edit, Adam, because I read your article about uh, BB yes. Edit. Yes, indeed. And I liked what you said about BB Edit. Uh, could tell us what. Tell us about that. Well, as I said, BB Edit 10 um, is just. It's. I think it almost gets a bad rap as a as a as a programmer's editor, but the fact is, is that BB Edit is just a, a killer writing tool. You know it. It lets you write. It gets out of the way. Whatever you need to be able to manipulate your text in some form or fashion, it's there. And so we've used uh, many word processors over the years. We used to use the used to use Word um, fairly recently for take control books, but we've actually switched that over to Pages. So the whole Office and Lion thing isn't really affecting us either. Interesting. Yeah. And yeah. So and BB at a ten, it was it was fascinating because. Watching what Apple did with Lion, where they were really trying to bring more people to the operating system, that there was this sense that they wanted to make it interesting to people who were not currently using the Mac, whether they were using iOS or they're coming over from Windows or whatever. Um, and and Barebones basically said, we're feeding our happy, loyal users with more power features. And they really didn't do anything in BB Edit that's going to say, oh, wow, you've never looked at BB Edit before. Here's why you got to take, take a look finally. It's just if you're a BB Edit user, it's cooler and more powerful than ever before. It's interesting com com compare and contrast those strategies. Apple going after non-Apple users with Lion, you say. And I think I, I think I agree in some ways. Uh, yeah. Certainly go going after uh, the the novice user. Perhaps. Look look at it this way. Whether or not Apple is targeting the long-standing Mac user, it's not an optional upgrade for the long-standing Mac user. Either you're going to need some hardware or some software that, that you got to connect to Lion, or you're going to buy a new Mac, or whatever it is. I mean, e the choice of upgrading to Lion is not so much if, it's when, Right. if right. you're a long-standing Mac user. Right. And so that's why I really see Lion as, and, and this is more so than with Snow Leopard or Leopard or anything in the past, too. Um, I really, really see Apple doing much more of this kind of thing, where, you know, iCloud is going to require, probably going to require some Lion stuff. You know, apps are going to start using it more and more. Um, just in general, Lion, I think, is going to be hard to avoid. Do we, do we think that Lion is the last uh, paid upgrade that Apple's going to do? Boy, they, I got, you know, they're get, it's 30 bucks now. It's almost free as it is. Mm -hmm. 30 bucks for kind of all the Macs you have around. Right. You know? I mean, I, I, I think this is... What are they going to do with subscription Mac? I don't think they need to do a subscription. I think that they make so much money on the right. on the OS and right. everyone buying uh, applications and the and the platform. I, I think they could just give it away. I mean, I don't think that they, uh, I don't think they need to charge for it anymore. Other than there's a well, Starbucks Oxley, you know, and Sar Sarbanes Oxley. That'd right. be the only reason. I mean, that's right. why they charge like it's dollar, for accounting one dollar for, for accounting thing. reasons. They yeah, they can't they can't yeah. give it away. Yeah, that's a that that that. that. That's that's another area in which I usually have to lean on my seeing eye nerds. Right. That, that that turns out the way they structure the company, the way they're going to reporting their profits, they can't simply give away things of value, or else they have to sort of claim it as a loss against some. If they, if, if they give you something that anybody would tell you is worth fifty dollars, then they have to report it as we lost fifty dollars on this transaction, right. or 
uh, the stuff like that. I mean, so I think thirty dollars for kind of unlimited installs is about as free as you can get. Yeah. I mean, that's, well, and that's partly why I suggest the subscription model because once right. they've got a subscription model, then they can give the stuff away as the ah, buyers. I get it. And so, and if you want to take it to the next logical extreme, hey, gee, how come the MacBook Air doesn't have well, 3G or obviously coming forward 4G? I'd love to see that. And so at that point, you can really see a subscription Mac. It really feels uh, like it should, you know, because instead of taking my iPad with me lately, I've been taking my Air with me. And the, the nice thing about the iPad is you knew you'd always be connected. And you, you just kind of make that assumption. Oh, yeah, this will yes. always be connected. And then you get there and you go, oh, I forgot. This is not 3G. Right. You know, it well, should be 3G. Well, and the other thing that... Uh, from a subscription perspective, you know, now that now that everything's coming out in the App Store, the question is, is what will Apple upgrade and when will they charge you for it? I mean, the theory, theory they already have you now in the log where right. they could just start upgrading line, adding features, doing whatever they're going to oh. do as just part of the upgrade path whenever That's they want. It's rather than having any charge you a launches, buck for the new... Or not even charge a buck. Just, just there's a new upgrade. Boom. I hit well, it. I mean, I, we added real, these features. Realize that Apple, Apple, doesn't even, is, Apple doesn't even like music subscriptions at this point. Right. So I, I think it's kind of a leap to think that they'll be start, we'll start to sell system software that way. I'm saying they don't need to. They, they, could just, they could just start updating Lion ongoingly and never charge you again. It could just be Lion for quite some time. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't, they don't, now that they have this upgrade capability, same thing with Final Cut 10. I mean, I think that's the one thing that no one knows yet is maybe Apple's just going to keep on, uh, you know, maybe they're just going to just keep on updating it. Oh, I don't know. So okay, so it's, it's it's just it's just such a basic tenet of philosophy. I mean, I was talking to a developer recently who decided that instead, who decided that they they just came up with like a big update for Lion, and they're trying to figure out: do we charge our old users for an upgrade, or do we, do we charge our our existing users an upgrade fee, or do we simply lower the price of the product in general and say every time we do some do a big update like this, like a big whole number figure release. We are simply going to have you buy a brand new edition. So you can, now you can buy it through the App Store, you can buy it through our website, whatever you yeah. want to do. Uh, where the people and they and there's still going to be people who are been using this product for the past three or four years who are going to say, "How come I had to spend twenty five dollars for a whole new copy?" Yes, but the last time we had you upgrade, it cost twenty eight dollars. I don't care. I, what's loyalty has to do with anything? So a lot, a lot. Of a couple really of things I, I want to point out. Real quickly from the chat room, one is that Apple has in effect said that they are going to do uh, incremental upgrades because they haven't booked the full amount of money they're making on new Macs. Um, and two, uh, Bob in our chat room said Apple changed the way they're doing their accounting, uh, witnessed the fact that Xcode, which was briefly $5 for that reason that you, sp you spoke of, Andy, is now free. I see it's free. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and I Which think pisses me off because I paid five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I want that latte back. I want my latte back. Yeah, the, 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 th the thing is, I think that for, for many developers, including us, I think it makes sense to have incremental upgrades and to charge for them and make it less expensive. I mean, we're already looking at the plugins that we do for Final Cut are going to be less expensive and, and so on and so forth. But, the, the, uh, but I think for Apple, who sells hardware and has a lot of, and makes money on every person that has the new operating system, I think it could make a lot of sense for them not to bother and just keep on saying, well, we're just going to keep on updating these, updating our software that way and making the platform more powerful because, you know, they're, they're selling hardware. So you know, actually, you have to install the new Xcode because the Xcode that I have on here requires Snow Leopard. So I need to go to 4. Point. You see that? I was, That's very complicated. Yeah. So I have Xcode 4.02, and it says, no, you have to have Snow Leopard. So you got to go to 4.1, and they're making that for free. Interesting. Hey, we got to take a break, but uh, we're going to come back with more with our great panel, our esteemed panel. In fact, we're going to do something new. Eileen, who was it? Was it just somebody emailed us and suggested... She has her it was on G Plus, okay. and I believe I wrote the name of the person. Maybe not. In there, did you? Okay, so somebody on I'll Google look. Plus suggested that we start doing two things on the show, and I think it's great because we do it on our other shows, a Lion Tip of the Week and an iOS Tip of the Week. So uh, we got an iOS Tip from Alex and a Lion Tip from Andy, and, of course, our regular Picks of the Week uh, coming up. Adam Engst is also here. If you like tips, his uh, Take Control eBook series tells you how to use just pretty much everything. It's not just Mac either, right? 
No? We, we, we focus on the Mac stuff, but we have a lot of iPad and iOS uh, iPhone books as well. So we've, we've branched out into other things a couple of times, but realistically, uh, people don't come looking to us for books on how to cook Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, much it, as what's a good book. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because that was the funny thing I thought, because we did the same thing. You know, we had a food program for a while. And then you started doing, like, take control of your taxes, of your paperless office, of your turkey <laughs> Paperless Thanksgiving. office has been huge. Has people it? People love that book. Oh, well, that's good. Be, because that is Mac stuff or, you know, computer it stuff is. where you're saying, how the heck do I get right. rid of all this crud on my desk? And it's not, you know, it's, you got to put together the hardware and the software and the, the procedures and, you know, what can you do? So Joe Kissel's done a fabulous job on that. So that's been really good for us. But, yeah, the take control of Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> not so hot, huh? <laughs> a couple of people have had really good Thanksgiving dinners with it, <laughs> including us. We, we cook every year. TakeControlBooks.com if you want to know more about uh, Adam's great Take Control books. Now, can I talk to you a little bit about, and I know Andy will be happy to hear this, audible.com. I finally finished, I had an 83-hour audio book. What was, was that? It was Jeez. the trilogy, the uh, the Void trilogy by Peter F. Hamilton, who is one of my favorite authors of all. It's a fantastic book, but I finally finished it. And now, Andy, I'm reading Endgame, the uh, Bobby Fischer book that you recommended, and you're right, it's absolutely wonderful. Uh, I don't. We're just Audible fanatics here uh, at at Twit. If you go to audible.com and slash MacBreak, you can sign up for Audible yourself. Get that gold account. That's a book a month. First month's free. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I, I just don't know how you're listening to MacBreak and you haven't haven't. I know. At least gotten a free book Look out of this, this one. Moneyball. This saying. was one of the great books of all time. They're now making a movie. I I never thought they'd make a movie out of Moneyball, <laughs> but it's the story of how. Um, uh, Brian Sabian at uh, is at the A's and how uh, who Billy, was it Billy Bean Billy Bean at the A's and Brian and uh, Sabian's of course the Giants and uh, and who was it on the Red Sox that he would they would talk about in here I can't remember but Billy Bean at the A's used statistics and numbers to understand the magic of of, of building a, a great team and it's and it's just fantastic and of course now it's all Moneyball every team has read this book. <laughs> but if you hadn't, you should. And I'm sure, Andy, you have a recommendation for us, too. I like to overwhelm people with all the great stuff we can get here. What do you What do you have for us? Yeah, I've, I've got like a sort of a substitution here. Uh, I've, I've bought two books in the past couple of weeks. One is a new book by Grant Morrison that I had to take a little break from. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that it was a bad book. It's just that it's. I'm trying to figure out whether or not I don't like it or whether it's just that, look, I really need to pull over the car right now and just sit and listen and try to let's try to make make sense of what he's saying here. He's, he's talking about maybe, comic books. It's a it's a it's it's called a it's it's essentially a musing an extended musing about uh, about the nature of superheroes in our society, how the comic industry works, and how they relate to basic classical storytelling. And I will admit that part of it is not sinking in. Uh, and so, I, I, but I'm not ready. I'm not done with it yet, and I'm not ready to say whether or not I like it or don't like it anymore. Part part of it is that I think that Grant Morrison has a writing style that he doesn't it, that works great when you read it as text, but you are very aware of all the extra words when someone is forced <laughs> to read it aloud yeah, to you. Yeah. And you're driving, and you're trying to figure out, okay, should I slow down because I think the light is going to change, or should I just keep on going and hope that I make the that, that's a lot to do while someone is saying. Meanwhile, the bark of the tree being bread, brown, yeah. orange, and purple. Some books are better for audio. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll finish it and at some future date just to make sure that people know that I don't just automatically recommend every single book that I get. He actually oh. reads them, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, <laughs> With his either ears. I listen, either, I listen to, I, I, either I start off reading them on Kindle and then I, then I get the Audible book to see if the Audible book is good enough to recommend as a novel pick. Uh, but so I, I decided to take a break with a, a book that I'm really digging uh, by Gordon S. Wood. It's called The Idea of America. And uh, David McCulloch is probably the most famous person who writes about American history. He wrote the book on John Adams, about uh, Truman, about, uh, about, the, uh, about the bridges, really cool stuff. Uh, Gordon S. Wood is doing some really great stuff. He focuses on the American Revolution, uh, what he self-disdainingly calls like the, the dull parts. Uh, which is uh, the, the uh, uh, 1776 to about 1820, 1830. Uh, he's written a bunch of books on the on this period. Uh, his latest book is really cool because it's a collection of essays, which means that it's a perfect thing for reading, uh, for listening to in audio, in audio. Because you can 
have go through one chapter in one commute, go through another chapter in another commute, another one when you're just sitting at home kicking back. Uh, but what I really love about it is that he takes a really different approach uh, from what you might have heard in school and what a lot of even popular commentators really go for in the American Revolution. Uh, he really goes down to here are the ideas that these men believed at that time. Here is what m made up these people. So when they're talking about conflicts between uh, they, between the colonies and the crown, they're not talking about, oh, well, they felt, they felt that uh, taxes were unfair and that they're being, being made to prop up a, a falling empire. It's no, it's more like they felt as though they already had a working country here, that they had some sort of divine right to be here that was independent of uh, of outside influence and therefore that outside influence was superfluous and he's not one of the and he's also doesn't take the attitude of well other people are getting it wrong i'm getting it right it's more like here's my perspective and here's why i believe things went down the way they did and here's why i think that uh the attitudes and ideas that went into the founding of the country have a knock-on effect and sometimes they're amplified by modern events and sometimes they're being misinterpreted and abused uh, by modern events uh, at any rate perfect like it's like it's instead of like one big giant hershey bar it's like a bowl full of fun size uh <laughs> halloween candy where you can just pop a few in your mouth and just have that wonderful experience and then the next day pop another few in your mouth uh and without having to feel as though you're absolutely committed to getting through a beginning a middle of an end of a book over a week or two week period I, i'm re i really am enjoying it. i'm about a third of the way through it which is usually the point at which i can say yes i'm gonna like the rest of this too so i can start recommending this sounds great the idea of america gordon s wood now there's two books Three, actually, if you include the one Andy's not sure about, that you could get for free right now. All you have to do is go to audible.com slash MacBreak. You're signing up for that gold account. That's a book a month. First month's free. First book's free. Yours to keep forever. Cancel at any time. And, you know, while we were talking, uh, and uh, you, you, you pulled us to the uh, Super Gods book, and uh, I saw another Audible recommendation right under it that looks really good. Fire and Rain, The Beatles, Simon and Garfunkel, James Taylor, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, and The Lost Story of 1970. See, I want to read that. This is the problem with Audible is that you, you browse around here. It's like the best bookstore in the world, 75,000 titles. And from now on, when you're sitting in the, the car on a commute or you're at the gym on the Stairmaster or you're cleaning house, you, you, that's not lost time. It's time you could use reading. I want you to try it. It's fantastic. Audible.com slash MacBreak. We thank them so much for their support of MacBreak Weekly. We're going to try out our new feature right now. And Adam, pitch in if you feel like it, if you feel the urge. Our Lion Tip of the Week. We begin with Andy Anatko. Okay, this is something that I just learned a few days ago in the midst of being really frustrated with Lion because there are a bunch of new concepts that Apple's really decided to articulate strongly in Lion. One of them is that if you're a consumer, let's hide things away that will only cause you confusion or lead you to get into trouble. So there are a lot of features that you're used to using in, in uh, Mac OS X from release after release after release. I was surprised when I was trying to get a, a, an app to, a, a bulky app to work again, that I could not find my user library know, folder. It drove me crazy. They've hidden it. Right. They, they've hidden it away. It's, it's, and it's a basic te technique. If you, if, if you double click on an app, you try to launch it, it launches, then immediately dies. Where well, the first it? thing you do is, well, let's, let's go into my user library folder, get that app's prefs file, drop it onto the desktop, and then try to launch it again. If that press file has been compromised in some way, the app will build a brand new one because it can't find it. Maybe it'll, that'll, that'll get things working. Uh, so, but you can get your, so, but in Lion, you cannot see your library folder. What you can do is, and, and here now here's them actually you, you're doing you're doing exactly the right thing you you got the go you got the go menu now hold down the option key and watch what happens Aha. and it causes your library folder to magically appear and Oops. so now you can oops, let's do it, it again go keep holding it down select and it, it will, amazing yeah. so actually that's probably smart windows does similar things where they hide user uh, from the users the system folders that could really yeah. mess you up it, it, it annoys me, but it does, I have to admit that it goes down to the point of if you know about the library folder, it's not going to really confuse you to have to look to find out how to get it back right. again. And also, that's that's only one of a different. That's only the easiest way you can get it back. You can always go to the command line uh, during the, right. in the even in the Go menu. You can simply type tilde slash uh, library, uh, and up, and you know enough that that that's the actual Unix uh, d d uh, path to your library folder. Uh, so you can get it that way. But there is this hidden trick that will let you get it 
pretty quickly and pretty That's quickly. a good one and very important. I think hiding the library f is really confusing to me. And uh, yeah. this, is some, yeah. this is something that I actually wrote an article about in Tidbits. And so two other aspects of that tip. One is if you want access to your library folder frequently, you can just drag the icon of it into your sidebar or your toolbar. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. get access to it quickly there. Or um, in the article that I did, which you can find on tidbits.com, um, just do a search on hidden library, there is a terminal command where you can just make it visible again. Unhide so it's just it. like it always ah, was. Okay. One of those, one of them com right terminal commands I hate it's, so a, it's actually ch flags. You're changing, uh, changing the, the okay. Unix attributes to, to Oh, of course. So they're using a flag, uh, an yeah. attribute to hide it. You could just now, here's what's it. What's really funny about this, though, is they didn't hide the system library folder or the top level library folder. Those right. are, of course, you have to authenticate to get into, but as long as you're hiding the one that you don't have to authenticate, why wouldn't you hide the ones you do? Yeah, I don't I know agree. what that I is think, all about. Well, I think that kind of makes sense because a consumer is not, necess is not necessarily going to leave his or her own home folder. I think that there, I have run into that confusion with new users before where they assume that, oh, well, library, that's where I keep my books, right. that's where I keep my personal information. Start putting documents I, there. No, yeah. no, no, that, that's system stuff. You don't want to poke around <laughs> in there. Go there. Well, yeah. And I know people that we, we have people at the office that install uh, Apps plugins the and library. other stuff into the wrong library. Right. They, they put it on their own yeah. library, and then not oh, everybody right. has don't, access to it across all the all the. Don't systems don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Apple shouldn't have hidden the user level library. I just find it funny yeah. that they left visible the other right. two. Right, right, right. Uh, now an iOS tip of the week from Alex Lindsay. So this was pretty simple, but I've been asked about it uh, four times in the last couple of weeks, and so I figured this would be a good one to start with. All right. So it's not very it's not very complicated. Um, and do this you want is, to plug we, your uh, here? We iPad? have the HDMI uh, connector for you. Oh, is that the right one? Oh, oh but your uh, iPad's I dead. No, 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 I got my iPad. I charged it. Oh, you charged it. Well, we were, you're pretty magical. I, you're a magical was, fellow. Here, sneaking, look at this. I was speaking of magical. Ago. We now have a cable that comes out of the table. It's a table cable. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like All the right. cat in the hat. It only comes out so it doesn't far. Doesn't go out very far. Yeah. Though. All right, there we go. So now so. we'll be able to see his iPad. I think. Can you see it? Well, my monitors <laughs> back here have been flickering on and off, but uh, no, I don't see right, it. That's right, a Eileen Rivera, by the way. I'm, I'm would, plugging. I'm plugging back. Who is the voice of God on this show? <laughs> okay, plugging back in. the producer. And uh, Alex Gumpel's run over. Jammer B is running over. <laughs> you know, How many engineers does go. it take to turn on an iPad? Wow, wow. look at that. So there you go. Now, so this is the so my the, the person actually found this for my for my wife was my uh, was my was my son, my three year old son, <laughs> who uh, he, so he's a more adept user now than anybody. In the my house. kids are very frightening. That's uh, amazing. Their, all all of all ages. So um, anyway, so if you of course you know that if you double click on the home button, you're going to be able to see all your applications here. Yes. Um, and and so you can you know quit applications uh, uh, and so on and so forth. But uh, what confused my wife and then I might, then a couple of people that have, that have asked me is that uh, you if you go if you swipe to the right you get this other interface right. and of course you have this little lock right. and this is what's but this is this is if you have kids they will find this extremely quickly and because they're always hitting the home <laughs> button and I've I've actually I was talking to someone at the airport I was talking to you know someone else at a, at an event and they were like I don't understand how you know how to I can't fix rotate this. my Mac anymore yeah you know it was working a second ago this is the button that you're looking for it's not um, funny and it's kids great find it. I use it all the time when I'm when I'm doing stuff where I don't want, I, I just want, I need it to stop right you know and so I, I this is a very simple one we'll get more complicated in the future but I felt like this is a real basic one that I love it was that. I was actually catching people um, that I knew and, and I will admit that um, I. I didn't know it was there until six months double ago. Double tap so, the so. home icon, then slide to double the Double tap right. the home icon, and then slide over. And, and of there course, you is. have brightness controls, and you have your play and, and uh, sound, but you also have um, the ability to lock your screen the way it is right now so that it won't rotate. And then you can And by it. the way, if you want to send us uh, Mac break uh, tips for Lion or iOS, I'm sure these guys would love having a little research help. Um, <laughs> I'd like to give credit to Todd Prophet on G+. Plus for Thank you, Todd. That was his idea to do this. Um, and you can email Todd Prophet and let him know. No, to email. What should we do, Eileen? Do we, do we have, I don't know if we have an address yet. That no, we, we can don't do that have with. one. Why don't you email Leo at twit.tv in the interim, and then uh, we'll get a Mac break at twit.tv. Uh, you know, it's, I'll it's think of a prize. so depressing is that we moved our email, twit.tv email, from our own email server to Google Docs. How's that working for you? 
It turns out that you can only have a certain number of email addresses before you start paying for them. Oh, yeah, we pay for them, and they don't work very well. And it was, <laughs> you know, we had hundreds of email addresses at yeah. twit.tv because we could just spawn new ones anytime we wanted to. It was very simple. So now I, I think we've... I don't know if we've lost control of them. I wish we uh, hadn't done that. Remember, you can do, if you want to do, it's like Mac break plus something. Right. At, okay, do then, that. So, do Leo yeah. plus Mac break at twit.tv. There, there you, you go. go. And then I'll be able to filter them out and uh, send them on to Andy and Alex. That's a great idea. Thank you, Adam. He's There's another tip. He's taking control. <laughs> That's a Gmail-only tip, although it is working on a number of mail servers. Uh, Leo plus Mac break at twit.tv. TV. But now it's time for our picks of the week. Adam, why don't you uh, why don't you start? Well, if you were talking about lion tips, uh, we of course did some you know articles about lion and tidbits, but it was a little awkward in some respects because you know we said yo here's some of our favorite features in lion but on the other hand we also wrote this 170 page book called take control of using lion which has way more detail than we could fit into a tidbits article and similarly way more detail than anyone could could hope to convey uh quickly in a in a in a video podcast or the like so take control of using lion and a companion guide for those who haven't already take control of upgrading to lion uh surprisingly popular book uh, this year we we'd worried that uh Upgrading to Lion was going to be so easy through the Mac App Store that no one was going to want help. But it turns out that uh, all of Joe Kissel's incredibly hard work and more test installations than you can count really uh, were helpful to people. People have been, have been very nervous about upgrading to Lion. And so he helps people walk you through clean installs, installing over Tiger and Leopard, that kind of thing. So it's, uh, you know, if you need to do something a little bit out of the ordinary or you're just kind of confused, Take Control of Upgrading to Lion really helps there. And then Matt Newberg's Take Control of Using Lion goes through all the new features and the features we're used to because you're using Lion and there's some Snow Leopard and Leopard features that are still left over. So you got to use those as well. How much are those um, books? Those are each $15 or if you buy them together, is a 20% discount. Take control of upgrading the line. Take control of using Lion as always. It's nice because they're ebooks. You could put them on your iPad or your iPhone or yeah, your desktop. We have them desktop. in EPUB, EPUB and Mobi as well as PDF. So you can uh, read them any which way you want. That's really sweet. Thank you, Adam. Sure. Alex Lindsay, your pick of the week. So I'm doing uh, the, the uh, I'm doing a couple things that uh, I was just talking to someone about the, my favorite apps on a flight. Uh, and so a little of this is a redux, and one of them is a, is a brand new release. Um, one of them is SketchUp Pro. Is I just want to remind people it's free. SketchUp Such Pro is free. Uh, we use it. Uh, uh, Brent By actually modeled the entire Twit uh, studio in it, and uh, I use it all the time to figure out where we're going to put cameras and how we're going to set stuff. If you, if you want to sketch out ideas, just remember it is free, and it's really easy to use. And if you're not... Uh, there's a pro version, of course, that you can out. So you said stuff. SketchUp Pro is free. It's SketchUp no, 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 is SketchUp, free. I'm sorry. SketchUp I'm sorry, Pro yeah, is not. Free. SketchUp Pro is not free. SketchUp yeah. is free, but SketchUp has almost all the stuff that SketchUp Pro has. It's a 3D and drawing program. It's a 3D it's drawing incredible. program, and it just it is such a great way to to play with 3D. There are so many great tools in it. If you're trying to figure out how just how you're going to block things out, and there's the, one of the secrets of SketchUp is that you can download models from the 3D warehouse. There's thousands of models. Like I put in like Kino flows and, and lights and cameras. I don't model those. I just go up to the, the thing and download them. They all come in, generally all come in at scale, like the proper scale and everything else. So all, all the models get along together. It's, it's just a really, really great app to have. So SketchUp is one. The other one that I was talking to someone about that I've just started to really use a lot is Skitch. You, you, you love Skitch. I am a Skitch fanatic. It was funny. Uh, you know, Keith was, was here a while ago and he's like, are you using Skitch much? And I was like, well, I like the idea, but I don't really, you know, and now what I'm doing is, is using it to annotate lots of stuff to email out. Like after we do live, um, live events, I look at our bandwidth and analyze it with little arrows and stuff like that. And it's just so easy. I don't have to go into Photoshop. I don't have to go somewhere else. I can just draw little arrows, type a little text and email it to everyone. And it's just, it's really great. And I've been using a lot of it. And then the last one that, that we've been, oh, there we go. Oh, you got See, little, this is Skitch. And you, did you know that you could do a snapshot? There Isn't that go. cool? The, um, I love that. Skitch is just, it's just awesome. And it's just, and, and you can very quickly just drag it into, um, whether it's email, uh, I drag a lot of stuff into a thing called chatter, uh, or on a desktop or email, you know, all of those things is just really, really easy to annotate. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to talk about was just Wirecast. I just want to give people an update. Wirecast 4.1 is up. Uh, it now supports, um, Teradeck. What and, is Teradeck? Um, 
tarot deck is, looks like a little cigarette uh, car. It looks like a little cigarette case that that is basically does oh. a lot of what the live oh, view does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a little antenna. It's, ha it's hardware. Yeah, yeah, and it's hardware. I know I'm doing three, but they're three li like quick ones. We are actually streaming on Wirecast right now. Yeah, and Wirecast 4.0 lets you do. Uh, it lets you see um, tarot decks, live view. It also lets you bring in have multi cameras into one card. Uh, it's a huge upgrade. Four point. It really should have been a four. So I always think of this as a uh, as a uh, kind of equivalent of the of the TriCaster, which we use to switch. It is in some ways. It's it's it a lot. It does that, but it also and I didn't know this, but we use it to. So we're, we, if you're watching our stream, we're running Wirecast on a big computer downstairs. It's taking the video from the TriCaster and streaming it out to all these different people. We. This is actually what I use when I do my own so podcast so cool. from my house. So yeah. I don't have all the hardware at my house. We have all the hardware here. We use lots of switchers. Right. When I switch at the house i've got four inputs it can also the thing wirecast can see is it can see every laptop on my network yeah so i can sit there and jump between different screens so you can, can use ip stuff. ip based cameras as well as yeah IP and screens. what this now lets you do the new 4.1 lets you um That's great. do that it, it is if you're trying to figure out what you're going to do for your corporation or what you're going to do for your school this is definitely one that you want to check out because it is it's so easy to use and it's mac and um, windows mac and windows i think the mac work version works a little bit better 500 the, uh, 450 bucks for the regular wirecast 4 995 for the wirecast pro and it's it is um but remember your how much is your tricaster i mean it's oh yeah it's, it's uh, one tenth the cost of a tricaster right and and my I'm my sorry. hardware mixers are a lot one fortieth right. the cost of a tricaster <laughs> so so the thing is is now with the new one you can have a mac pro matrix makes these cards with four inputs you can hook four or eight cameras into this thing and be you know editing away so it's um it's a really really uh, I, I i learn to like it more every every single time i use it my pick if you're buying a, a new macbook air you might say 64 gigs it doesn't seem enough in fact that's what happened to me i bought the macbook air in october and i quickly found that because i i'm using it now for broadcasting i want to put windows on it i needed more space I was very happy to say that uh, Otherworld Computing has a very nice upgrade that's very easy to do. The, the solid-state drives on the MacBook Airs are not like regular drives. They're more like memory cards with a connector on the short end. They sell them for the new Air as well as the old Air. Uh, look, this isn't cheap, but it's surprisingly affordable for 180 gigs, 379 mm -hmm. bucks. I bought the 240 gigs. It was about 500 bucks, and it's it's really nice. It It's like having now... A ton of storage on uh, my MacBook. I'm really happy about it. How fast uh, is that? How fast did it say that the? the uh, well, they claim it's faster. I can't tell if it's any faster, but they claim it's up to 40 percent faster, 68 wow. percent faster for things like uh, uh, capturing video to your disk, things like that. Then, a, then a spinning drive, and they say these are even faster than the uh, Apple stock drives. I, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, it's certainly no slower, and it sure is nice. Uh, I love Solid State. I, there's something that's going to be very exciting when when, uh, when Black Magic or AJA finish their their SDI to um, Thunderbolt connection. Mm -hmm. There's something about being able to capture uncompressed 444 into a into an air. That Solid will... State is beautiful, baby. Awesome. Solid state. And now, uh, finally, Andy's pick of the week. Andy Anako? Uh, mine is something I've had in the house for a while now. Uh, Elgato is a company that makes that really cool ITV device for doing Love it. turning your Mac into a, a DVR, uh, tuning live video. They recently came, or rather, uh, a, they recently teamed up with another company that, was that had this really cool little box called the HD Home Run. Uh, now oh, yeah. Problem and the the problem with like the original uh, ITV was that it was USB sticks. So you had to always keep it plugged into a Mac. That Mac pretty much always had to be running uh, in order for it to be have TV available uh, to other machines on the network. This is its own little Ethernet device. So you just plug this into the network. Uh, uh, plug this next to uh, next to your cable box. So if you want to split out and get the actual cable TV, uh, or you can put it wherever in the house you get the best reception. So you no longer have to have a Mac next to a cable uh, cable TV outlet uh, or next to you know, the top of the roof where you can actually get over the air clear signals. Uh, and then any Mac that you've got that's running the ITV software can find it on the network and use it as a tuner and do all the cool stuff that the ITV software does, like record stuff, uh, excuse me, uh, act as an access point for uh, the ITV software for uh, your iPhone or your iPad. Uh, and it's just a really great way to get HD TV video on your network and on all your devices. Uh, there are a bunch of other apps and other hardware boxes like the Slingbox that are very, very good. I like the Slingbox for very different reasons. But the difference between that and, uh, and the ITV solution is that 
the currency of ITV is you have an MP4 file on your desktop with HD video on it. So if you want to do some cool but rather boring stuff, uh, meaning uh, to access your home network by your iPad and watch this HD video uh, via Wi-Fi, you could do that. But you could also uh, have the ITV software on your Mac back home uh, after it makes the recording to please copy that onto your Dropbox account so that in your hotel room you could simply download it wow. and then sync it and play it as local HD video. That's just so you cool. Store. So it just gives you a whole bunch of added options. And now that it's a network device, it doesn't mean that you have only one ITV that's only available for one uh, of your machines in the network. It is available to every single machine on your network that's running the ITV software. Now, does, uh, and does it's it, also, go ahead. Does it work with Comcast? Like, well, this. Uh, it, it does not. It doesn't have a cable card uh, slot, so that it will only work with either over-the-air broadcast digital or anything that's coming over your cable your cable connection via ClearQualm. Okay. So the unscrambled channels that every cable company is pretty much forced to. Uh, fewer to and fewer of those out there, but yeah. Well, but still, it'll it'll get you the Letterman Show. It'll right. get you the Craig Ferguson Show, and you know you're out of luck if you want to. I read a copy of uh, King of, <laughs> of, 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 uh, of Entourage or something like that, but uh, it's still pretty damn useful in and of itself. Uh, but it also it has two, two, two tuners built into it, so you can actually be wow. watching. You can actually have one computer downstairs watching TV on this, and then another machine upstairs actually recording TV. Uh, so it's, it's, as I said, very flexible device for a whole bunch of different users, especially if you're someone like me who if they're not necessarily happy just recording something they also need to make sure that just just watching it later they also want to make sure that they have it in their library so they can watch this tv show pretty much whenever they want again a perfect companion for something like the uh, itv because you have a tuner there and you can do it all um actually it, it would it would replace it does all it the replaces jobs. the itv right it, it is is it essentially imagine instead of having oh it has a tuner of course you don't it need has, a tuner has, exactly it has yeah. its own tuner has its own uh has its own uh cable antenna I'm going to just now use the high-tech zoom-in features uh, so that right, <laughs> wow. so you can see that really this is just all you need. You just plug this into your network, and now you have a network TV tuner uh, that you can then access via whatever Mac you have on your network uh, that has the ITV software built in. Now, I was a little bit disappointed. It would have been really awesome if the ITV software for the iPhone and the iPad could simply connect to this remotely and directly and just uh, tune in live video. That's not the case. If you st if you want to use those two uh, iOS apps, you still have to have a Mac that's actually running at the time to host the content and act as the conduit. Uh, but other than that, uh, it's a little it's a little bit pricey at 179 bucks. But again, if you're kind of a bit of a bit of an archivist, uh, it's kind of worthwhile. I mean, just last week, I finally got around to hooking up a. I've got one cable box in the house that does not spit out HDMI that spits out old-fashioned analog so I finally got around to reorganizing uh, the my hardware in uh, so that I've got now a DVD burner connected up to that device so that when Dyna Domino is on great performances I can now not only record that and watch it but also convert that easily to digital video and have it in my iTunes library forever and ever I'm re I'm looking at this website silicon dust is the name of the company siliconduscom and they do some interesting stuff. I wanted to learn more about this. Uh, They're in some cool stuff. They actually yeah. they, they they actually make a version, I believe, of uh, of the HD Home Run that actually works with cable card. So on, under those circumstances, you could lease a d a decoder card from Comcast or from Verizon, mm. possibly plug it into this thing uh, and actually have it work that way. I'm not sure if that model works with uh, Elgato's ITV software. The cool thing about when you buy it from Elgato is that. Uh, you get a discount on the package price. The cost of that box plus the cost of the ITV3 software uh, ah. is cheap right, as a bundle. And you really want to use it as uh, with the ITV3 because that's what gives you all the really cool secret sauce that makes it all Mac-like. And uh, I, I do it. like that software. I really do. So you don't it's need the Elgato hardware. You just you buy this from Elgato, and it has the Elgato software as well. That's great. Yes, it'll, they'll sell you a package that has this one, which they've li apparently licensed from this other company, but they'll give it to you in one box package with the ITV3 software. Very cool. HT Home Run, Elgato, E L G A T O dot com, $180. Andy Anako is at the Chicago Sun Times. His website, The Celestial Waste of Bandwidth. He's at I H N A T K O on Twitter and okay. joins us every week for MacBreak Weekly. Thank you for being here, Andy. I appreciate it. Alex Lindsay, same thing. 
Pixelcore.com is the uh, multimedia guild, which is just down the hall from here. <laughs> you right moved. Right. <laughs> yeah. our, they're our neighbors. We're, yeah, it, uh, now I, when I when I, I just go, oh, I have to go over to the studio. I don't have to get in the car. I don't have to do anything. Just, we just walk around. We share, feet. We yeah, share exactly. the, uh, the brick house. Uh, also, pixelcore.tv if you want to see the programs. And every Thursday now, you're doing live shows at pixelcore.com slash live. What's coming up this Thursday? Dear Media Tech. So we're going to talk to Brent again. Uh, Good. I think we're actually going to be talking a little bit about this studio. Brent, uh, oceanstudio.com is the guy who did that SketchUp 3D yeah. of our studio, but he's also the guy who did all the lights, cameras. I mean, if you like how the studio looks, Roger Ambrose did the canvas. Brent painted it in. And in the Pixelcore channel, we did we, we posted the color discussion we had with Brent last oh, month. Oh, good. And uh, good. So, so if you go to YouTube and search for Pixelcore, you'll see it in the channel. I wanted to see that. And it is awesome. I mean, I, and of course, it starts off with me saying, oh, this is only going to be 40 minutes long. And then <laughs> two hours later, we're like, okay, we better stop. So. Brent is a, is a god. He just really did a beautiful job here. Uh, speaking of gods, Tanya and uh, Adam <laughs> Engst. Our, our American gods, they run Tidbits for 21 <laughs> years now at Tidbits.com, the best newsletter uh, for people who want to follow Apple, and it's absolutely free. It's a really uh, great, great deal. I, you know, you guys have made this a must-read every single week for me for the last two decades, and I encourage everybody else to check it out oh, as well. Thank you, Leo. Tidbits.com. Well, thanks for being here. We love having you on, all the yeah. way from Issaquah, Ithaca. <laughs> it's just like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, you just, just start with an I and go from there. <laughs> thanks, Adam. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. thank you, Alex. And now, thank you for joining us. But you better get back to work because break time is over. <laughs>